first and foremost, man, um, it's a pleasure having you. It's You're, great to be uh, here. I've, I've seen yourself for, for actually quite some time. And I was saying before we were walking in here, I was like, oh, man, I, someone messaged me from your team a long time ago to, to get on uh, that network that you created, uh, Valuetainment. Yes. And, you know, I've been seeing yourself more lately. Obviously, I saw you on Rogan. Um, I've seen you do stuff with Tate. I've seen you do a ton of stuff. And, and I just kind of like the perspective you take on a lot of topics, a lot of things. Um, but first and foremost, so you came in with a book, and, and that's releasing soon, right? Yes, this is coming out Tuesday, December okay. 5th. So, uh, so I, I figured, I figured like you're probably doing like a podcast run. And you're like kind of like I don't know, promoting the book or just talking I'm about. I'm just the book. on the road right now, you yeah. know. Uh, but uh, ours wasn't for the podcast run. Yeah. You and I just connected about doing a podcast. Yeah, together, yeah. And it's so interesting that I saw the, I saw the title of this and just like just just brought me back, man. It was like I've made so many mistakes. Not, uh, I don't even so it's like choosing the right enemies. Just like I don't know. It's like seeing something before. How do I explain this? Like before it was a thing, like for me on social media, before like I didn't know that social media was going to be what it is today, right? Like I'm 34 years old. I started in social media in 2011, 2010, before Instagram blew up and was this thing that was like, oh, e-commerce. Is... And I learned all this stuff and I, I learned all the, you know, I learned everything the hard way. I learned everything the hard way. Um, I learned how to like do the marketing the hard way. I learned that like, Everyone's going to like, if it works, they're going to take it and use it for their own. Um, and it's interesting. Like, it's so funny. I, I bet you if I probably read that book, <laughs> like I don't even know what's in the book, which is based on that title. If I probably read that book before I did all the social media stuff, I probably wouldn't necessarily. I mean, I could be in the same situation because people tend to make mistakes even when they're told, yo, like you shouldn't do this. And here's like the guidelines not to do this. And here's what to look for to, to not run into this or to not have this happen. And people still end up making the same sort of mistakes that mm. maybe you've learned from and you've written about in that mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I kind of want to get right into it with you. Like, you're obviously wildly successful in a lot of different facets. What do you think for young men is, and let's say like the age range of like 18 to 25, because you know everyone goes like, oh, from, you know, I always hear like Gary Vee be like, from this age to this age, you focus on this, and this age to this age, you focus on that. From like 18 to 25, because it's a lot of the demographic, uh, my audience, what do you think is the most important thing for men to, or women, to focus on to get closer to like whatever their goal is? I would say the the, the most, and by the way, I got to tell the audience, I thought you were 5'10", because I was <laughs> about 265, 265. If you've not met him, whichever camera I'm looking at, Face to face, this is a big guy. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit. I had no idea you're 6'3, 265. I thought you're like the yeah, bodybuilding 5'10, 5'11. Yeah, no, no, yeah, it's cool. It's typically we're talking about it. Tall guys are not, yeah, yeah. big guys, tall not guys all, are more, yeah, yeah but, but uh, you're a legit big guy. No, so you know, it's a good question you're asking. Here's what I would say for me, it was more about you know, everybody's trying to choose an industry or a software, or do I sell this product, or do I go do real estate, or do I go do content creation do i go be a youtuber do i what do i sell what do i do do i become a coder i am more interested at 18 to 25 for me to learn the right habits for example my kids i got four of them 11 10 7 2 okay my son everything with me with my two kids my 11 and my 10 year old everything is what do they love first what strengths do they have that they like are they numbers are they sports are they art, movies? And then from there is to give them the best examples in that area for them to model, right? So if I'm 18 to 25 years old and I want to go out there and win, I'm not choosing an industry. I'm choosing a leader. So if I'm 18, you and I are buddies at 18. We're like, hey, bro, let's go make it in Hollywood. Our focus, if we were 18 and we want to go into Hollywood, I would have been like, dude, what circle do we need to get into? Because you see, John Favreau always does movies with you know, Vince Vaughn, you know, Swingers or whatever these movies they do right. together. Adam Sandler always does stuff with, you know, these guys always are doing movies together. So I want to get close to a person I can model that's winning. So if it's real estate, I would make the list of top 10 best realtors in my community. I want to go work for that guy. If it's YouTubing, you know, YouTube, I want to go find out, okay, Bradley, does he need anybody for me to come work for him, watch him? I want to come Watch to see what you're doing. I'm going to go choose a person to duplicate their habits, how they negotiate, how they fight, how they lose their emotion, how they 
you know, lower the temperature in a room, how they read different people, because you're in a meeting with four or five people negotiating, but then the best part about the negotiating is what? The debrief on how you go into a meeting, then the debrief after you leave the meeting. So after you leave the meeting, like, so Bradley, what'd you think about the guy? You think he had the leverage? Do you think they meant it? Do you think that threat they gave us that if we don't come up at this price, they're not going to go above it? You're like, I don't believe him. Mary, what do you think? I think you're like, wow, so that's how they negotiate afterwards. So now after 24, 25, you either are so in love with this crew you're running with, or you're like, I don't like the way these guys do things. I can do these seven things better, and then boom, you transition. But to me, number one is picking up the right habits from the right leader. So, okay, so I guess because I've been asked this question so many times myself, but sometimes people just straight up be like, I don't like know what I want to do. So how do you think someone could figure out what it is they want to do first, right? So obviously if I know, okay, I want to be a real estate agent, I could find these guys great advice, right? Amazing advice. But if I'm just like looking around at people and things, and I have an answer for this, but I, I want yours on it. How do you to figure out what it is that you want to do? And obviously that's so complex and it's like maybe in, this year you want to do this and you do it alone and you realize you don't want to do it and then you move on. But how would you start being like, okay, this is what I should go towards? So, so my counsel is actually to the people that don't know what they want. Because if you do know what you like, for example, right now my you know, 10-year-old son, he is playing soccer. His day starts off after school from 3 to 4 he swims for an hour. Then he comes, finishes his homework. Then 5.30 to 6.30 is baseball. Then 7.30... Uh, uh, 6.30 to 7.30 is soccer. Then he's going to do jujitsu, And then he goes and does this. That's a schedule four or five days a week. But now he's kind of like starting to fall in love with soccer. But we're not going to pick and choose until he's around 13, 14 years old to kind of be able to focus on two of them, right? The kid that knows what he's going to do at 16 years old, this advice means nothing to that kid. But the person that's indecisive, doesn't know what industry they want to get in, what matters more is the individual you work for. Because... Okay, so let's just say if I uh, um, spend time working with you or training with you. I'm a tall guy. I'm 18 years old. I don't have the physique you got. But I come and start saying, hey, man, can I work out with you three days a week when you work out? I go 5 o'clock in the morning. I go 6 o'clock in the morning. I come watch to see what you do. You're super set. How you do it? Do you do chest back? Do you just do push-pull? Are you push-push guy? Are you pull-pull guy? Do you do legs once a week? Do you do abs every day? What is your format, right? And I kind of study you, but I also watch your discipline. No matter what we do, you don't eat a certain thing. So whether I leave you and I go to another industry, what I picked up from you paying attention to details, the discipline, the habits, that's going to help me in real estate. So it's, it's, got, it's industry uh, 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 proof. It's got nothing to do with industry. You pick up the right habits from the right leader. Then if later on you find out uh, the right industry or thing you want to do in your life, you're going to be fine. There's a quote that kind of moved me when I was younger was called sometimes on a way to a dream you get lost and find a bigger one sometimes you don't know it sometimes you just kind of going you're like you know I think I want this I think I want that I'm like oh there's no I'm, that's what I want and then you're obsessed you're maniacal you can't stop thinking about it for three months six months you're like no this is not just a thing I'm excited about I'm still thinking about this so thing. do you think that's that's how because all the things you were saying is like, it's all in hindsight and retrospect of like, you knowing what you know now to be able to like decipher. And obviously, cause I'm asking you these questions like, okay, what should a person look for? Like, you know, you're in these meetings and you're outside these meetings, you're looking, you're attentive, you're seeing, you're coming to work out with me. Oh, he does this and he does that. Like some people don't even know to like look for that. Cause right now in the world, there's so much of that on the internet. You could just go look at some YouTube videos. You can go get some information. Like you can learn so much information freely and openly where is like that's what i find interesting that some people don't see that first and foremost like that's not the first thing they go towards like they're not discerning the information that way they're just going like that guy has success and he works out and even though that maybe they want some of this stuff i don't know that if they're not like looking for the right points or pointers to to like so my my question to you was before you knew how to look at everything that way and you were younger, you were 18, 19, like how did you start to find your first like push towards success where you're like, okay, like do you think you were just a different breed from like born? No, I, I was a, so I was a 1.8 GPA kid in high school. I was good in math, but I failed biology. I, I, I was not uh, uh, good in school. I went to the army right after high school because to me, I'm going to do army for 20 years. That's kind of what my uh, deal was. That's one day I'm staying at my sister's apartment. We're partying at the jacuzzi downstairs off of Burbank and 
Balboa and Encino, by the way, that so apartment you're out complex. Here? Down here, yeah. <laughs> and it's I'm 18 years old. And then 4 a.m. I come in the morning uh, upstairs. Sister wakes me up saying, I don't know what you did last night. I'm about to get evicted. I'm like, I don't want to hear this right now. I got to sleep. I slept very late. You got to figure something out. I'm like, I'm not figuring nothing out. I get up in the morning to go to my car, 1983 Toyota Corolla. My mother left him when she went back to Iran because I just sold my Chevy S10 long bed with those low profile (laughs) wheels and the system. That was me at 18 years old. I bought that truck from an MS-13 leader. (laughs) <laughs> the day I bought it, that night I got arrested in L.A. in front of Arena at 16 years old. So that's my story, what it was at that time. But so I go outside to find a Corolla. It's stolen. Can't find it. Yeah. We find it a few months later in, in Tijuana. But I, that, that moment I come upstairs. I'm in the balcony. I said, what am I going to be doing? I call my dad. I said, come pick me up. Take me to the recruiting station. We go to Glendale. The guy, the recruiter, Jesus Guerra, I've been looking for this guy since I was 18. He had been following up with me since 14 years old. He told me at 14, a guy like you should join the Army. I said, if you can get me to go to the Army tomorrow, I'm in. He said, it's going to take six months. I said, I'm not signing up. He makes calls. Two weeks Why did you want to go so bad? I just wanted to get the hell away from here. Nothing was going my way. I was working at Burger King at the time at 18 years old. Uh, I'm, I'm with crowd of kids. You know, One of the guys goes to jail for eight years for selling ecstasy. 100,000 ecstasy pills he gets caught with. Another guy ends up dying from taking Vicodin pills, my best friend in the world. And it just, it was a bad environment. I just wanted to get away. I'm like, I'm, I, do, I do not want to be here. So I got away and I go into the army. I said, I'm going to do 20 years. Then I'm going to get out. I'll be a firefighter and then I'll be a cop and I'm good. So I go to the army. I'm in it two and a half years. I'm the best Hummer mechanic on my unit. Not a big deal, but to me, I'm winning in yeah, life. Right? I'm a Hummer mechanic. And I'm I'm a bodybuilder. That's who I am. I'm training. I'm. I'm I see some be old this, pictures of you. The old pictures, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I was gonna be like you would come to my room. I had a picture of like all the Angel Tevis, Amy Fadali, and then I had Chris Cormier, Arnold, you know, Ronnie, Aaron yeah. Baker. That era. That was my era, right? Uh, so, yeah. and then one day I get a call from a guy named Kogan, and this is the key to kind of give you maybe the answer to the question here. He calls me, Kogan. He says, uh, "What are you doing?" I said, "Nothing, man." He says, "How's, how's everything?" I said, you realize it's 10 o'clock. I'm in Kentucky or in L.A. What are you doing? Call me at this. I got formation in the morning. He said, what are you doing? I said, everything's going good. Tomorrow I'm re-enlisting for six years. He said, you're going to re-enlist? I said, of course I'm re It's my ceremony. I'm getting an Army accommodation medal from Lieutenant Colonel Peacock. They got everything I wanted on my order. Go to DLI because I speak multiple languages. Sears School, 18 Delta. I'm going to Vicenza, Italy. They're giving me everything. He says, you can't do that. I said, why can't I do that? He says, you just can't do that. He spent an hour on the phone pleading with me to get out. I said, tell me why. He says, because, Pat, I'm telling you, I believe you can be very successful outside of the military. Who was this person? Kogan. Okay. This is the, this is the only guy that came and visited me in the Army. He was with me for three weeks. We had a great time. When he said this to me, this was the first time somebody poured into me where I'm like, whoa, this is an interesting language on what you're talking about. Believe in, you're capable of this. I go to sleep. I wake up in the morning. I can't go to sleep. I go tell Colonel Peacock, I'm going to get out. I'm not staying in the Army. Anyways, I get out, and obviously from there things change. But to answer the question for you, in life, those who do something big, and I'm talking very big, they have three things in common, okay? One, they experienced unconditional love from one person. That's all you need. They experience unconditional love. You can screw up. You can get arrested. You can come home drunk, acting like a fool. You're sick as a dog, throwing up all over the place. It's okay, baby. Mommy loves you. You're like, man, this person loves me like this? I was an idiot tonight, and you still love me? Wow. The possibility of this kind of love exists. That's hope. Two, you need unbelievable pain of betrayal of someone whose approval you will never gain. You will never win. You're going to go, it could be an ex, could be a father, could be a mother, could be a uncle, a coach, a sibling, somebody that shattered your heart, publicly humiliated you, and no matter how much you win, no matter how much money you make, no matter how buff you are, how much you bench, how much you squat, you're never going to win that person over. It's unbelievable pain. The third one is choosing the right enemy. The third one is choosing the right enemy. Explain that one. 
The first the two one. I understand very clearly. Yeah. The second one I understand extremely personal. The, the third one I, I want to understand your perspective on it. Yeah, what, I, can, what that, I, I can tell. By the way, I'm saying this to you because that's, that's kind of my life, these three. The third one is like, dude, we choose so many wrong enemies for no reason. Like, you know, you're a, I'm, a, I'm a diehard Laker fan. Screw the Clippers and the Celtics. What a waste of an enemy. And we consume our time looking at the numbers and the data. Da, 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 da. For what? How much time am I putting into this enemy? You, you, Lakers don't pay you shit. What, what, what do you mean enemy? Or this or that. Now, later on, if you own a team and you're like, now you can have real enemies because there's business involved. Enemies could be, <clears throat> you know... Somebody you're competing with, there may be a level above you. It's not like a big deal. You're like, oh, okay, this. And then some people just do something to you that wake your ass up. I'm 24 years old, 23, 24 years old. And at this point, I'm going to Vegas 26 times a year. I skip the Zizix, the drive, the three and a half hour drive that you make to go to, you know, Vegas. And I'm partying, pimps and hoes and all this stuff. And Naked was the club back in the days. That was a big deal. And all these, but this is, you know, Garden of Eden, uh, Century Club. I'm talking Dublin's. I'm talk this is old school stuff. You're 35. I'm 45, 36. I think you said I'm 34. 40, 34. Okay, Same so shit. so 11 years. So you know, it, it, maybe you know those names. You probably don't know those names. But I will tell you what happened. One day I go to Christmas party with my dad, a Syrian family. We're in Glendale. We're nobody. Our families nobody there's no one in our family that has something to say well you know the david family this my dad's working at a 99 cent store on uh manchester right next to great western form in inglewood he's had so many heart attacks my dad is like you know he went from being successful in iran lost everything and he just came here divorced just one of those reputations incredible man so we're at this christmas party and so you're 28 one, years old i'm 23 24 years okay. old bro this one relative, who's a sweet guy, says one condescending comment about my dad. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> I look at this guy like, I'm going to kill you. And then I look at my dad and I saw my dad go like this a little bit. Oh. So. <laughs> like in, in disgust or? In, in embarrassment and yeah. in pain. Yeah. And then I looked at him and I said. I'm giving you permission to talk to my dad like that. No problem. You want to talk to my dad like that? It's your fault, Pat. I said, Dad, we're leaving. He said, what do you mean? I said, we're leaving. He said, we just got here. I said, we're leaving. He said, we're not leaving. My family's here. You're not going to embarrass me. I said, Dad, we're leaving. He pulls me aside. He says, this is my family. I said, Dad, I'm telling you we're leaving. I'm your ride. Tell him we're leaving. And then I go around, hey, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. We're leaving. We walk to the car, we're fighting the entire time. We get in the car, we got a 30 minute drive back to Granada Hills because I'm living in Granada Hills at the time. I say, he doesn't talk to you like that. I said, these people you helped, I know these people. Who the hell is he to talk to you like that? And then I asked my sister to come home and my brother-in-law, Siamek, to come home, Paul and Siamek. And I said, I don't care what happens, the world is gonna know your last name. They're gonna know how incredible a father you are. They're gonna have to kill me, but they're gonna know who you are. Bradley, I didn't know that was going to be my enemy. All of a sudden, I call my girlfriend. I said, we're done. I go, 17 months, no sex. Well, I'm telling mm. you, 17 months, no sex. I go, 17 months, no sex, because I'm single at this time. I drop Vegas. I tell all my friends, don't call me anymore. They thought I'm bullshitting them. Everything for me became obsessed about winning to make this guy proud. That fire at 23, 24 is still here, and it's still pushing now, enemies is not just that story I'm telling you. It, it comes in many different shapes and sizes and shapes and forms. But for you, and I say you, I say anybody, it's, you'll make a very interesting exercise. One of my flights back from Chicago, I took a yellow notepad out and I just started writing people who said comments or a look that were piercing. And I just wrote it down. I'm like, oh, and I wrote it down. Keep writing, 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 next page, blah, 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 blah. Because typically it's like, I'm the best, I'm the greatest, you're a leader, you're a this, you're, yeah, whatever. I read this, I'm on a flight, and I'm ready to roll. And then that became my affirmation. 
rather than the affirmations for me being all the positive things, it became these affirmations of what people said. And then that produced juice in me wanting to go in ways I wouldn't have normally gone. Because to do something big and like, look what Elon's going through right now. I was right? going to talk to you about this, yeah. I mean, if you look at what Elon's going through right now, who the hell wants to be Elon? Why would you? I mean, think about it right now. Imagine you got $245 billion right now. Yeah. You're worth $300 billion. You're going to go by Twitter and be the most hated man in America. Yeah, it, and, and not only that, but he's, it's, it's, I always find it interesting how, like, I, I see people's comments even just about that where people say, like, oh, this guy's going to be broke in X amount of years. Like, you think the, the, one of the richest men in the world who got to this point, you know, is just going to be broke? It's just a crazy thing, yeah. the way that people kind of, like, will dig at you. But in regards to this Elon thing, what what is your take on it? What do you think about? Because I I I feel very strongly. I I definitely agree with the idea of like okay. If these people are, you know, saying oh we're not going to advertise here because we don't like the fact that you're on a platform and you're allowing, basically, free speech that's not being tailored to one side or the other, um, then it's just a weird concept that I see. It's like our. Are people resisting that? Like, is that the res is it the resistance towards that? Because he went on to say in that, I don't know if you saw the excerpt, he went on to say, like, when he was speaking to that guy, he went on to say, like, if this company fails, it'll be at the hands of these people who said, we're not going to give you, you know, all this money anymore. And the, the guy who's, who's interviewing him is like, well, aren't people just going to say, like, you just made bad business decisions? And I find it, I just find the whole thing so interesting because at the core of it, is it, is it the resistance of free speech that people are like, cause everyone's starting to see it now. Like I could even speak from a perspective as a creator on YouTube and other social media platforms where I'm like, I can't say certain things. I can't do certain things. I know that if like a really dumb example, if I didn't bleep out swear words in my podcast, I would be, you'd be demonetized. You'd be like a little bit, you know, like your videos won't show up. And it's like, I could understand this one, but you know, back when it was like the COVID stuff, it was like, you talked about this, your videos were like shadow right. man, your account's shadow. And it's yeah. just like, it, it's like what became like, what's becoming of, and this is a whole greater conversation we could have, but we'll talk about that after this Elon thing. It's just becoming like a weird place where even as a creator and as someone who's been on the internet, I, cause I've been on the internet for the last YouTube for the last 12 years, mm -hmm. Instagram for the last 15, like since like well, I guess 14, 13, 14 years since 2011. And I, I just noticed, I've seen all the transitions of it when it was like, it first started being this, you know, I think back in 2017, family friendly was a mm -hmm. thing. And then, you know, they just keep like guising it in different things of like, essentially, you know, all these big advertisers wanting these platforms to function a certain way. And then obviously the big platforms like kind of you know, moving for those advertisers. And then now you have this guy, Elon, who's like, well, obviously he's very successful, highly, one of the most successful men in the world. And he's like, fuck it. And then you have these people interviewing and questioning like, well, you're just going to be like, they're going to say you made bad decisions. And I just find it so interesting, the whole thing where it's like, well, what's what's happening? And yep. where is this going? Yep. Like in the long run, is it, is it, <sighs> I'm not trying to get so political and like so, divisive because like that in and of itself is also just like creating more discourse that doesn't need to be there nor more problems that doesn't need to be there but like i just don't i don't see the problem in having a platform that you can say things without it being like just it's gone and you, you can't do that and your account's gone now you know first of all heroes depending on the levels of hero are born based on tension right if there is tension there's resistance and you stand up then you're a hero. So the more the resistance, the bigger the hero, okay? A hero could be somebody as small as, you know, the raccoon is chasing the little girl. The mom comes and grabs the raccoon. You've seen this video going viral. And she throws the raccoon and gets the kid coming in, closes the door. That's a hero. But she resisted the pain of the raccoon biting her hand. That's a level of a hero, right? Right. It could be, you know, uh, a fight breaks out. You and I are at, at a bar or at a restaurant, and we see a guy talking to a girl and he raises his hands and he hits her like, dude, listen, we don't know what's going on here, guys. This can't happen. You guys got to figure this thing out and we're going to break. We're a hero for a minute in that bar, right? But what this guy is doing, they are, they're trying to tarnish, destroy his reputation at the highest level 
And he's standing up saying, go F yourself. And says, yeah, Bob. You know, when he says, Bob, you know who he's talking the about. Disney CEO. Bob yeah. Iger, Disney CEO, right? So, but let's look at this. Let's actually look at this. Do you know how much Disney has lost in a year and a half of their stock? Do you know how much they've lost? I don't know the details, but I do know. I've, I've read a good amount about just like, I don't know if it's the boycotting just of like the certain movies that they're putting out like that, but I've seen it go down. So $195 billion. They've lost 56% of their stock. It's so bad right now that guess who's celebrating behind closed doors? Apple, because Apple is the only one that can buy them. And now Bob Iger is kind of trying to split up the company so people can buy pieces at a time. He and this is facts. Like, These are facts. This is online. You can go yeah. take a look at this. So they've been having a conversation with Apple. Apple's sitting right now on 150, give or take, billion dollars of cash. Yeah. They're sitting on real cash, you know, is what they have. And that's public info. It may even be a low number I'm giving you. So let's look at Bob Iger. Bob Iger chose the wrong enemies. What did Bob do? Bob chose parents as enemies. Bo Bob chose parents as enemies, and he chose the transgender community as his allies. What? Your number one customer isn't kids. Your number one customer is the person that controls, has the power of the remote. That is the parent. You, you thought for a second the, the kid is putting on. You got to win the parents over. So what happens? Flop after flop after flop after yeah. flop after flop that Disney has. So for Elon, when he's taking a position like this, or even Dana, you yeah. saw the clips with Dana, you know, with Peloton or yeah, Dana absolutely. with a couple of the companies he talked about. You're seeing guys like Dana, guys like Elon, inspiring others. And some of this started off with a little bit of Trump where he was not backing down from the media, inspiring others to say, I want to have a backbone. You just saw Connor right now saying, what are you doing to my the country? Like, yeah. this, is, this is when you're starting to see, hey, I like the fact that you got pride in what you're doing. I like the fact that you got pride in certain values and principles that you got going on. And Elon's definitely got that. But to me, I think this is a very normal transition that you're going through. Uh, uh, were your parents married or did, you, did they go through a divorce? Oh, <clears throat> my... Uh my mom, my mom remarried. My 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 parents got divorced when I was five. Like my father had passed away when I was very young. Yeah, he took his life when I, when I was six, and then my mom remarried after that. I had no idea. No, it's fine. Yeah, that's so, the whole. Sorry to hear that, bro. Yeah, we talked about the pain thing earlier. Right, that was right. like the yeah. driving factor I got you. for a lot I got of my. You. I totally got you. Yeah. So when when you like think about your mom gets remarried, you're five, right? Boys, no matter how old you are, you're protective. We're all protective, right? In a weird way, we're all kind of protective of our mom. Say the man comes in and he imposes himself on your mom, okay? And he does a little bit and your mom's like, I'm sorry, Johnny. A little bit more, I'm sorry, Johnny. And then, you know, it starts becoming an asshole. And then now he pulls out the violent card or now he starts becoming like a jerk. Now he starts humiliating you in front of everybody. All of a sudden, one day you're 12 years old, you just come and you punch him in the face. And you throw some shit at him, or you even you, at that moment, you, you all you're thinking about is protecting your mom. You hit him with a baseball bat, okay? And he's bleeding. You know what just happened? He just realized he can't screw around. See, the way bullies are wired, Bradley, is they're gonna go as much as you let them go. Yeah. Mainstream media bullied. Politicians yeah. bullied. Government bullied. Today, Joe Biden uh, tweeted something out. And he says, did you know if we tax the billionaires in America 25% of their wealth over the next 10 years, we would get $440 billion. Think about what we can do with that $440 billion. You know what I said? I tweeted back. I said, You're, you would spend it within a half a second. I said, I trust money being more in innovators' hands than politicians' hands because yeah. they know what to do with it. Yeah, they're but, not but, sending it in random places. That's the point. But the point is now... We have these social media tools to push back. And then people who are trying to figure things out, they'll sit there and say, you know what? He makes sense. I, he's right. Why would we give that money to the <clears throat> government? So the great equalizer has been what Elon did. If Elon doesn't buy, buy Twitter, you think YouTube would have been looser today? YouTube would have been tighter today. What Elon did with Twitter, he opened up the floodgates for everybody. Two companies, Spotify not dropping uh, uh, Rogan, yeah. big deal. Yeah. Elon buying Twitter, and I would even put Rumble in there with what Chris is doing. 
Right. These three companies got everybody to be like, whoa, we have competition now, guys. We can no longer bully. We can't just control. We can't. Yeah. And that's a good thing. I have a question, though. You know, when we, cause when we talk about like this whole like these companies being bullies, right? And I, I very much, I've seen a lot of your stuff. Obviously, I, I'm going to say like, I'm not just over here, like just citing everything you say, but I'm, I'm on the same page as you, but I want to play the devil's advocate because yep. otherwise it's like, we're just in a echo chamber. Yep. So my question is like, do you think that uh, these companies have some like just cause in their mind for the decisions that they're making? Like, do, do you think that they think that they're doing like a good thing? Like genuinely, do you think these people are just like in a room being like, we're fucking evil and we want to do evil to people? Because I also don't think that that's true, but I don't know to what degree. Yeah. So, okay. So let's, let's unpack that. So a percentage of people, maybe, I actually do believe a percentage think some people are evil. A percentage of people think they know what's right and you don't. Okay. They think they're better than you. They think they're smarter than you. They think they know what's best for you and I simply because of a piece of paper they got from a university that brainwashed them into thinking they're elitist and we're dummies, okay? A percentage falls into that camp. So one, a group that's true believers that think the opposition is evil. Two is a camp that has been convinced that they are uh, uh, right and the rest of us are dumb and we're greedy, we're selfish, whatever we are, Right. And then you have a third camp. The third camp is <clears throat> a camp where, um, you know, these are guys that are owned by the money people. For example, why, why did Elon say, go F yourself? Let me say it one more time. Go F yourself, right? Why did he say that? Because he has money. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need advertisers' money. So he has put himself in a position to not need the advertiser's money, so he can't say that. Now, flip it, okay? If your name is... But do you think Elon could sustain Twitter without advertiser's money? Well, here's what's going to... This is going to be a great case study, by the way. There's a big risk to it, right? Yeah. So the, the, the greatest risk to it is the people that support what Elon is doing, they have to keep him in business. For example, every time we go to Barnes & Noble... I want Barnes & Noble to stay in, in business because I want a bookstore to stay in business. So we'll go in and we'll buy a few thousand dollars of stuff. We literally will go in and they know Support. they're here. So we'll get cases, kids, go, boom, 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 boom. And I always ask the cashier, how's business? When he does your calls, are the profits good? We're still doing okay. Fantastic. That's great. And I encourage everybody to go keep buying Barnes & Noble books for them to stay in business, right? Okay. If you support what Elon is doing, you got to support him financially. You got to support him by defending him. You got to support him by making sure that he makes it, the company makes it. That's what customers have to do. What's happened with Disney? You know what people have said with Disney? I'm canceling my membership. Yeah. That's what they're doing. So this is what happens when you forget who the customer is. You make some mistakes. And Elon is trying to say, this is who I am. So the people who respect his boldness have to jump in there and say, how can I help you? How can I support you? So to the last community, with this whole ESG community, the DEI community, the CEI community, the corporate equity index, the diversity, equity inclusive, you know, we got to hit these numbers. If you guys got this score, we'll invest money into your company. If you don't, we won't give money into your company. You'll be downgraded as your stock if your stock gets downgraded and all this other stuff. So watch what happens this last year. Uh, uh, out of all the uh, Major League Baseball teams, right? Do you know what's the only Major League Baseball team that didn't have Pride Night? I don't. The Texas Rangers. Oh, should have figured. You know who won yeah, the I World Series? That one. The freaking Rangers won the World Series. Think, think, think about how weird that is for a second. Yeah, I, Texas, but that can't change. I mean, but the point is, they're not the best team in the league. I'm a Yankees guy. I'm a, you, you understand? I'm like the energy is that real? But but that's not the point. The point to me is sometimes some some things are in our control. Maybe God is trying to say something. I don't know. What the hell was the Rangers doing winning? You were not the top five best team in the league. <laughs> They won the damn world, and they're the only one that didn't have a pride night. So what's really going on today? I think today is like, today's a, like if there's ever been a time where, you know, the, the right enemy, the right thing that drives you can bring out the best in certain leaders that we haven't even yet seen. Like imagine how many Elons 
how many kids Elon is inspiring. Like we don't even know the next layer of yeah. 50,000 Elons that are, I'm going to be Elon, I'm going to be Elon. Think about what they're going to be doing. We're not going to see that for 20 years. Yeah. So, so, so the point is these guys that are standing up, they're inspiring an entire different generation of people. But Elon also needs the backing from the people who support him to also defend him. That's how we show support to a certain value and principle that we're about as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, dude, I, I, I love, I love what he's done. I love what he's doing. I, I love what he stands for. I love the fact that, you know, you don't take like that. And because of obviously he's in a position to not have to take like that. Um, and I just, I just think like nowadays it's becoming, I don't know, the internet and social media and news and po politics and wars it is becoming a very interesting thing. I think I, I was talking to someone about this the other day, but you, you would, I mean, only 10 years older, but I feel like it's kind of always been sort of this like way. It's just been a lot more in our face because of so social media and the way everything is more rapidly spread. Like, do you think that social media is having, cause I remember it was so funny when social media first started, I started was doing Instagram and shit, but like, like even YouTube, everyone's talking to you like, oh, you're like some like stupid kid. Like this is kid shit. Like this is not really going to be anything. They teach right. like, oh, this is dumb. And like, these are all real jobs. And like, this is all like, and now it's like, there's so much focus on social media. Oh, yeah. It's just, it's crazy how it's all progressed. But I guess, do you think that social media has been like a, a net positive or a net negative in this whole, like, seems to be like ideological war in a sense. All right, guys, quick interruption for the podcast. Tis the season. Obviously, if you guys are looking for gifts, I'm I'm like historically have the hardest time picking gifts for people. Really nice, simple gift. Sunglasses. Shady Rays. Check it out. These honestly, like, I got these ones because I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm I know I'm gonna go snowboarding and I'm gonna go skiing soon. And they're fly, clearly amazing. Now, these ones maybe might be better on the slopes than these ones, but yeah, also sun's never goes out of style, right? It's always here. It's always sunny. Why not have sunglasses? Buy some sunglasses for your significant other. And honestly, Shady Rays makes it easy because there's so many styles to choose from. Um, this is probably one of my favorites, hands down, easily. But yeah, check it out right now. Shady Rays, 50% off. Use code RAWTALK. ShadyRays.com. Put in code RAWTALK. Get 50% off on two or more pairs. Do it right now. Listen, easy gift. Easy for me. Easy to do. Stylish. Honestly, no, these ones are better. These are better for sure, 100%. I'm in the zone right now. I might just start doing podcasts with sunglasses on now. Again, it's go to shadyrays.com, code raw talk, 50% off two or more pairs right now. Uh, yeah, or just don't have a gift for Christmas. That's that too. It's just exaggerated everything. That's all it's done. Yeah. So, you know, back in the days, like 30 years ago, if you are at work and you're an executive at, you know, let's just say whatever uh, company, Del Taco, and you're their vice president, you're making 150 a year, and you get into a fight with your wife, okay? You get off the phone, your office phone, six o'clock, terrible fight. You're on your way home on 405 freeway. You got a 45 minute, 50 minute drive. You got 50 minutes to calm down before you get home and decrease the chances of a terrible fight. Today, you're that same vice president at Del Taco. You're making 150, 200 grand a year. You get into a fight with your wife at six o'clock. You got 50 minutes drive time. You're texting her, you're calling her, you're FaceTiming her. Your immediate reaction emotionally is experienced right off the bat. Instantly, okay. Yeah. So we offend, we disrespect, the tension goes higher, and we don't have a, oh, boom, go back yeah, to like normal, right? Reality. Re reality. Yeah. This thing exaggerates everything, right? It's an exaggerated. It's a two, but it exaggerates. Now, having said that, if used properly, you know, it can do a lot of good. If used negatively, it can do a lot of damage. We're seeing the negativity on kids with TikTok. We're seeing, you know, the craziest thing we're seeing that's, be that's being done that's inspiring younger kids. Like if you look at the percentage of kids that are pa part of the LGBTQ community, you look at the traditionalists, it's 0.7%. These are people that are born in the, you know, they're, they're pre-boomers. Boomers is like 1.7%, then it goes to like 5%, then 10%. Gen Z, 21% identifies as LGBTQ. What? You mean in 50 years we went from being 0 0.5, 0 0.7% to one out of five? Yes. How the hell does that happen? 
Because they're on TikTok. And on TikTok, whoever they turn into a hero, we're going to model. So, for example, watch this. When you and I were coming up, it was about life of the rich and famous, right? So it's like, oh, my God, this show life of the... Did you see that limo? One day I'm going to have a limo. When's the yeah, last time you got a limo? Like, limo think dude. about a limo, right? <laughs> Limos used to be like, dude, we're getting picked up in a limo tonight oh, when we God. go out, right? <laughs> Today, limo companies are going out of business. Yeah, There's yeah. no such thing as a limo <laughs> thing, right? Wow, look at the house. Look at the helicopter. Look at the pool. Look at this. Today, it's, you know, almost confusing that that's bad it's gone from being the life of the rich and famous to the life of the poor and victim like oh my god you know it's so what can i do to get a bigger reaction of people feeling sorry for me today so that's very confusing so now kids are indirectly like the the the, the energy power fame prestige brings to want to have that like no matter who you are at whatever level you want to walk into a room and you want to have some respect. You want to have some fame within your cousins. I'm the one that got my four-year degree from UCLA. You know, I'm famous for the UCLA grad, or I'm famous because I just got promoted to my regional vice president of Budweiser, and I'm doing this. I'm just bought my first condo. We want a little bit of that prestige and the fame and the so respect. So it's become right? like a trophy. Yeah, we. But whatever hero, that whatever the market turns into a hero, kids want to look up to and become that, right? Emulate, yeah. Emulate, exactly. So it's very, I mean, the, the market's turning some of the most weirdest things into heroes. TikTok's turning some of the weirdest people into heroes. So is Instagram, so is mainstream media. So kids are so flipping confused. Like if there's ever been a time to take your kids out of public school, today's the time. Like when you and I went to, did you go to public or private school? Both. Okay. Yeah. So I went to private and fifth grade in Iran and then it was all public school from Germany and yeah. in LA. I went to Glendale High School and Wilson Junior High School. So public school, I went, but public school back then was not the public school of today. Today's public school is a very different public school. Okay. It's been 16, 17 years since you went to public school. Yeah. And it's been a long time for me as well. It ain't the same thing today. So Protecting your kids to make sure the influence they're getting, having the conversations with them, asking them what do you think about this, asking them what teachers are saying, asking them what kids are saying in school, talking to your kids early about that kind of stuff. Most parents are afraid of doing that. And if you don't teach them, trust me, somebody else will. And you're going to lose your kid for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And it's it's interesting. I've had a, I had a few conversations with people. Like I just randomly went to a beach. Uh, I don't know, a couple months ago, I randomly went to a beach in, down in San Diego, and I was just, like, standing there, and some guy recognized me. He was like, oh, you're Bradley. I've seen your podcast. And then he started telling me about, like, his his daughter and how she's in school and, like, these these things that, that these teachers are teaching her um, in regards to the LGBT stuff and then in regards to, like, some socioeconomic stuff. And I'll just give you the, the socioeconomic stuff. He's like, he was having this conversation with this this, like, teacher after the fact because he was listening during a zoom like teaching because this must have been during like the end of or something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh <clears throat> the teacher's like she he said something and he asked the daughter like he hears the teachers talk about like oh this uh this is a homeless guy or some shit. And, like there's someone with a ferrari and oh, the person with the ferrari should sell the ferrari and like give money to the homeless guy and uh, and then he goes back to his daughter and he's like, hey, what what was this like conversation? Like, what did you take from this? When Because he heard it. And then he went and asked her. Oh, and the daughter was telling him how like, oh, like uh, people with money, not are bad, but they don't need it and they should give it to other people. And I'm like, <laughs> and he was also like, this is just a weird, there's no real, like, how do you teach a kid? There's without any sort of context outside of that. Like, how did the person get the Ferrari? How long did they work to get the Ferrari? Like. How do the homeless, not that like you shouldn't help other people, but it's like to just go from like, okay, like that's a, that's a very like high level, like socioeconomic, mm -hmm. like, like conversation piece that you, your teacher doesn't need to be having. Like, I think the class was like math. Like they should be have a conversation about math and like the problems that they're solving in that class and not like this, this teacher's own sort of input on the socioeconomic status of the world and how you should treat people in it and stuff. It's just, it's just a weird thing to have your teacher teach that without teaching any sort of perspective around that. And also just kids are not like, they're not ready for those certain conversations yet. And if they are, maybe it's with, from their parent, right? And not from a teacher that's supposed to teach math or like social studies or something. And it's just kind of, 
it's weird because I didn't realize that until that point because I've always heard these conversations that people have and they're saying this and I'm reading on Twitter, everyone's fighting over this and kids in schools and all this. I'm like, I don't, and then I finally had these conversations. I had one there and I had like two other ones in like Santa Monica, same kind of situations, walking around and people talking to me and like they're with their family and I just have like little conversations. And I'm like, wow, this is actually happening. That like people are obviously teachers have their own sort of input of like, oh, I believe this or I believe this. <clears throat> and they're like injecting this into children. And it's like, that, that's, there should be some sort of like line there. You know what I'm saying? And there's just, I don't think there's a line there. Like, they're, cause they're, you can't even control it. Cause unless you're in the class 24 seven, you couldn't be like, what's being taught to that's my right. kids. That's right. And it's just a weird time. And then, yeah. like you said, you go to social media, but the social media one trips me out a little bit because it's also like algorithm based, right? I don't know, like are the algorithms themselves, the platforms themselves injecting this sort of like, narrative into itself to like spread because algorithm algorithm based stuff is like specifically nowadays you click on something it knows it knows your phone knows everything you touch everything you type everything you say it knows everything and it, mm -hmm. and it, it puts mm -hmm. it into these platforms it gives you more content based on the things you're saying like you never you know you're on amazon it's like you buy something it gives you like 10 other That's things right. to buy all this yeah. kind of shit is all based on your input so i also with the social media side of it obviously the parent side is a little bit like more cut and dry, even though it has to be like looked at for it to be fully understood, which was like a whole nother undertaking. But social media side is is like it's too it's too hard to say this is exactly what's happening unless there's some other outside source that's like injecting. I don't have kids. No, I want kids. You, you do want kids. I, I totally want kids. Okay, yeah. so you're not you're not part of the camp that's afraid of having kids. I mean, I'm somewhat, but I, but I want a family. I want All a family right, more good. than anything. I love that. Yeah, but but what I'm saying is like social media is like. The algorithm base, if I'm a kid and I'm looking at this, yeah. then I just start seeing more of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, I I go down that road. Just like politically speaking, people, they listen to this way this person talks. They just get more of that or more of like that side of the spectrum of right and wrong and in this political sphere. But the same thing with like that sort of content, because you don't just start getting that content randomly unless like you're kind of engaging with it. You know what I'm saying? So... It, that's what I'm saying when it, when you talk about the social media and like people getting these like heroes that they're looking up to and like kind of like starting to emulate. I'm, I'm wondering, is that coming directly from the platform pushing it or is it the kids are actively like searching it and finding it because they're being questioned or asked about it? Well, regard, regardless of what it is, if if the algorithms favor a certain content going viral more than another one, I mean, it's there's already certain words you use in your titles that if you do, it's going to yeah. get suppressed. You yeah, know, yeah. that's so the, 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 the major virtual governments, these social media co companies have the power and the authority to control what goes viral and what doesn't go viral. They have that influence, period, right? Yeah. Like, you know how you go to your video creative studios and like suggestions. How many views out of the million views, how many of them were suggested videos? Oh, okay. And you look at somebody else's channel, and you're like, 49% is suggested. I'm at 22%. Huh. Yeah. That's interesting. You're getting 49% suggested. Why? Got it. What if you were 49%? So it's a very interesting data to look at yeah. on your videos, right? So all of that stuff is around. But again, for parents, we have to simply be involved. We have to simply be asking a question like what your friend, the guy you met at the beach in San Diego, when you're walking, the guy's come and say, hey, Bradley, I know who you are. And what the teacher did to him, you just have to have the conversations with them. Yeah. And let them know, what do you think about it? What do you think about this? So the other day, my kids and I were at this restaurant. We go to Louis Bossy in uh, Fort Lauderdale. And I typically used to go there three to five times a week. I would have my meatballs and balsamic glaze, my, you know, the board with martadella and all this stuff. They went in with the Arnold Palmer. They treated me royally. But I haven't been there for two years because I moved to Fort Lauderdale. So I don't recognize the camp. I go to my wife and kids and the hostess at the front has her back towards me. Hey, is it going to take a long time to sit? No. Interesting. That's the service, yeah. Okay. Finally, they take a citizen in the back. Waitress comes up. Uh, so you guys going to have the uh, same thing? Is it just going to be water? I'm like, uh, uh, ma'am, is there any way you can lower the temperature? Nope. You can't turn off the AC? Nope. Okay, let's go. Uh, what happened? I, I'm, I don't pay for customer service like this. We're out of here. No, no, no. I'm so sorry. Just I said, no, no, we're out of here. My kids, this has happened in front of my kids. I say, Look, guys, my wife knows. Okay, let's go. Where are we going, babe? <laughs> I said, babe, where do you guys want to go? Let's go to Seasons 52. We haven't been to Seasons 52 in Boca for two years. So now we go to Seasons 52 Boca. And I tell them, so now we're talking in the car. 
So tell me what happened there. Well, you know, she shouldn't have said no. I said, but what's the point though? So then I explained him the tears. I said, you know, there's this thing called Yelp. If you go on McDonald's, Yelp. The average McDonald's Yelp rating is one and a half out of five. And the worst score you can get is one. So they suck in customer service. But guess what? You're only spending 10 bucks. What do you expect? Yeah. You're not getting a lot of service for the money you're spending. So there's tiers to restaurants. Lowest tier, don't expect great customer service. That's why you're paying such little money. Then it's next tier, then next tier, then this tier. This tier, if you're paying 200 bucks a head, guess what? They better give you a level five service, yeah, of course. right? Or else. I said, we went to here. So daddy risked going to a restaurant where the food isn't that expensive. So the waitress could or could not give you good service. That's my risk. But I get to choose what I expect from service, and I chose to leave. Now we're going to go to this restaurant. When we walk in, if this guy gives us great service and asks the right question, I want you guys to pay attention. We will determine what tip this guy gets. The average tip people give is around 18 to 20%, but we'll decide what we're going to give this guy. The guy comes in. Hi. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hey, how are you guys? Okay, so what can I get you? What would you like, Mom? What would you like, Dad? Great. da 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 how about, how, how's he doing so far? Oh, like a nine and a half. Okay. So he doesn't know we're doing this to the guy named Michael. Anyways, it ends. Crushes it. I've never met this guy before. Gives incredible service. Food ends. Everything is good. He keeps coming back. Refill on time. Everything on time. I said, what should we tip this guy? Daddy, I think this guy deserves 30%. I said, how about we give him 100%? He says, 100%? <laughs> I said, I said, 100%. But I said, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the receipt to him and tell him the reason why we chose to give you 100% is because we, the David family, value people who go above and beyond with service. And we value what you did to us. You were fantastic. They take the bill. They go up to the guy, Michael. We chose to do this, and I'm recording this. And I take a picture. I said, do you mind if my kids take a picture with you? The guy's emotional in tears. <laughs> we take a picture with the guy, and then we leave. We get in the car. So watch what happened there. They just experienced dad making a sudden decision of waking up and leaving to then, if I don't do the second part, these kids could grow up being assholes. Yeah, I see. So you have to do the second part and explain it to them and say, hey, here's what's going on with these kids. The average kids that I go through that feel like they have this, they typically have mommy issues or daddy issues or upbringing or they didn't have this figure or they didn't have that figure. You have to understand that. You have that. And this person doesn't have that. And why do you think this person feels this way? So I'll have my kids watch uh like you gotta have real early conversation with your kid i had my boys at uh, five and seven years old in my shower in plano i said okay mommy's there brushing her teeth i said okay guys i gotta have a conversation with you come here why what's going on come here stand right here we're all taking a shower sons daddy and the two boys i said whose peepee is that and they're like looking at me all weird i said who's dangling is that mine whose is that mine whose is this yours Okay, who gets to play with yours? Who? Only you. God gave it to you for you to play with it. <laughs> who gets to play with yours? Only me. Who gets to touch that? N nobody. Nobody. Okay, who can one day touch it? Who? When one day you meet a girl, then she'll do that and help you touch it. But till then, it's only for yours to touch. Mine is your mommy's. Yours, you're going to find yours. You know what's crazy about this? What? I've never actually ever thought about because obviously i want to be a father yeah. i want to have kids yeah. i've never actually thought about how real this the way you're explaining this in this That's moment it. will be yeah. like, but you know when you're gonna when do you're it, explaining it and they're gonna be like oh, okay but guess what happened to them now yeah. do you understand this is mine i play with it you play with it you play with it great you don't know what's gonna happen in school when somebody comes as i show you mine you show me yours and all this yeah. other stuff with two boys and all this and you're stuff. like no yeah no yeah. you're not gonna do it and it's only for a girl one day it's only for a girl one day you shape their mindset that way god will choose a girl for you one day, right? So then they replicate that to each other, and it is a standard. Yeah. And you have the same conversations, and I ask, man, my wife just ran out. She's like, this too on I said, baby, you're going to have this conversation <laughs> with your daughter one day. But we need to have these conversations today probably more than ever before. And if parents were open about it, we're talking about it, then we're setting them up for success. It doesn't mean they're going to be bulletproof and people can't try to find ways to exploit them or take advantage of them. But at least when that opportunity comes, they're going to know daddy and mommy had the conversation with them on how to make a decision for themselves. What, what do you think changed? What do you think changed where we got to the point where we are now where it's just so, everything's so like loose? Because you, you, you know, you're a little bit older. Obviously, you have children. Yeah. What changed? 
Is we, it just like some like what? Because because in my opinion, not my opinion, but my question to you is really like, what 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 would be the purpose of this like? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll dissolution tell you. of. Okay, so I'll give you my. You know. There's three communities that have ruined America. Three communities that have ruined America. It's the tolerant Christians. It's the do your thing libertarians. <laughs> And it's the rich Republicans that don't want anybody to know that they're Republicans because they're afraid they're going to lose their Democratic friends. and They won't be invited to those parties. So let me unpack this for you. Most Republicans are cowards internally. They're frightened. They're so afraid. They're so scared. They, and when I say Republican, forget about Republican. Let's say conservative is the word. Most conservative. What's conservative? It's my money I worked hard for. You know, my kids, conservative, I believe in family. I believe in man and a woman marry, have kids, and they raise conservative beliefs, right? Okay. So why Christian, tolerant Christians? Because there's so much like, it's okay. It's okay. Where the hell are your standards? Say it's not okay. What do you mean it's okay? No, it's not okay. Stand up and say, no, it's not okay. The Pope, it's okay. Come have a luncheon with us. Yeah, invite that trans group. Yeah, let's do this. What the hell do you mean it's okay? Where's your backbone? What's the manual you follow? Did you recreate one? Do you have a new one? You know why Muslims are growing at the pace that they're growing? Say what you want about Muslims. They average 2.9 kids per woman. Christians average 2.1. The way it's going right now, within 30 years, Muslims are going to be running America. Whether you like it or not, the House, the Senate, governors are going to be Muslims. It's what's going to happen. They're just, having more kids. Just because of the birth rate. It's just not, you're not going to be able to compete with them. It's purely mathematical, okay? Christians, non-Muslims are not having enough kids. U U.S., at this pace, if we go with the math, it's going to be a Sharia law in U.S. It may take 30, 50 years, but it's eventually going to happen because Christians only have one kid or two kids. Muslims, they want to keep having kids. And God forbid you say something about Prophet Muhammad. God forbid you say something about their God. God forbid you disrespect them. Do you know what happens if you do that? Khabib is in a press conference with <laughs> Connor. Yeah. The guy asks a question and he says, hey, uh, uh, Khabib, uh, you know, uh, uh, salam alaikum, hey, and also Connor, want to congratulate you on your proper 12 drink. Khabib responds, hey, hey, you can't say those two things at the same time. You can't yeah, say salam alaikum right. and say, and then he says, yeah, shut the fuck, what are you going to do? Do something about it, right? He did. Yeah. And he wouldn't let go. And then he lost his mind. You think Khabib gives a shit about money? I had him at my event a few months ago. No. We were doing an interview. But Khabib is such a believer of his country and his religion that they're not tolerant. So the tolerant Christians in America ruined it. Like, yeah, let's take out, let's take out prayer out of school and replace it with what? Whatever you take, you have to replace it with something. For example, let's just say you're a smoker and you smoke two, three packs a day. I'm gonna stop smoking. The way you quit is you got to replace it with something, right? What are you going to replace it with? Vape? It's the same shit. Well, I'm going to quit smoking this, but I'm going to replace it. I'm going to quit doing this, but I'm going to, okay, what is that going to be? There's got to be a replacement. We replace prayer with what? Indoctrination. So number one problem was, number one community was the tolerant Christians. I don't want to go too much into it, but that's the first one. The second one thing is libertarians. And I identify as a libertarian because I'm kind of like the guys like, look, let me just do my thing and just kind of leave me alone. It's what I want to do. Yeah, because let's talk about this, and then I want to talk about more about tolerance. We'll talk about it after. No problem. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the libertarian side is kind of like, you know who the, the, the most guys that just work and do their thing and they're kind of independent? They're libertarians. They have the wiring of, dude, I don't care. If I want to put drugs in my body, it's my body. If I want to smoke weed, it's my body. If I want to do this, it's my body. All right, cool. To, to, to each his own, right? Okay. That's great. But the do your thing libertarian community gave so much leeway to the establishment that finally they're like, oh, now we're going to do our thing with your kids because they're with us now in school. Eight hours a day, they spend more time with us than they, they do with you, mommy and daddy. Oh, sh we screwed but, up. But what's the purpose, though? Like, what, what's control. the point of it? It's control and to get them into a way of thinking that's different than yours and mine. Look, if you want data in America, public schools, do you know what percentage of English Teachers donate to the Democratic Party, 98%. Do you know what percentage of science teachers donate to the Democratic Party? 97%. Do you know what percentage of math teachers in public school, this is public information, math teachers 
is not 98, is not 97, it's 87. Why? Because at least math, you and I get to sit there and say, yeah, that, that logic doesn't make sense. <laughs> the logic doesn't make sense. What are you talking about? This just doesn't make sense. So there is a, and by the way, in Twitter, when, one of the first things that Elon Musk, when they went and found out about all their employees, 98% of Twitter employees were donating to, to the Democratic Party. So that was one of the first things that Elon kind of leaked to the public. And he's like, wait a minute, what the hell is going on here with the Twitter files when they released it to the public? So the first one is the tolerant Christian. The second one is the do your thing libertarians. And the last one is the, the rich conservatives that are afraid of being targeted. God forbid they target them. So, hey, make sure we don't tell anybody because if they know, we will not be invited to that party. You know what's funny about this one? Yeah. I have a really famous friend, like a super famous friend who's uh, in the music industry. And uh, I'll, I'll never say the name, but he, uh, I remember he was talking about not posting like or having to post uh, congratulations for Biden for winning the election um, when he didn't feel that way. But he knew that if he didn't post it, that he'd be somewhat alienated from this. The, I mean, essentially the music industry. That's right. And, you know, I guess a portion of his audience. And he would be. But that's fucking crazy. It is. Because, like, I guess the thing that I, I, I could under, I could see why, but I also go, like, what, what's happening? Like, why, why are we losing? We've lost our backbone. That's yeah, why, what I'm trying to say. We've yeah. lost our backbone. So we have gone away from putting a leader first, a leader with backbone as first. Okay, everything in life is, is but about. But is it because everyone's afraid of losing money? No, no, we've made money, God, instead of leadership and values and principles. Like, don't get me wrong. You got to have money to have a bigger mic, for sure. Yeah. But at what cost? At what cost? So, you know, how much money can I give you for you to become gay tomorrow? Can I give you a billion dollars? It wouldn't change my sexuality for money. But, but do you understand? What if I told you, starting tomorrow, I want you to do a surgery. I want you to become a girl. I want you to get a boot. I'm being honest I with you. I do that. But I want you to think about this. Would you do it for a billion dollars? No. Would you do it for I $10 billion? Dollars? No, I love being me. What if I made you the richest man in the world? No. That's the point. We need more guys like, like you. But but watch how stupid of a question this is. What I'm asking, like, what kind of a question does somebody ask me? But what are you talking about? That's the point. We got to get back to that. There's certain limits in life. But we're not even we, talking about a billion dollars here for most people. It's like I, I know it's, that. It's, but 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 trust me. Like sometimes it's become fame and money has become more valuable than actually being a valued leader with character that's tough, that's stubborn, that's willing to stand up, that's able to reason and able to you know give his message, give his argument, get people to say, "Here's how I think about this. Here's what I think we ought to do. Here's why we ought to rise up and stand up for this." We, have, we are out of whack in our priorities. We, we look at heroes in a complete different way because of social media error. It's a very confusing way of what we look at. You know, it, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's no longer about I mean, how many followers can I have, how many likes did I get, how many this. And by the way, this goes across the board to everybody versus, no, nah, I'm good, man. We're not taking money for that. You know, we're not going to be doing that part. You know, like the other day they had a conversation with a couple of our sponsors. They're like, well, you know, we'll give you a million dollars. Nope, we're not doing it. We'll give you a million and a half dollars, whatever the number they were offering us. And my guy, the marketing guy's doing the math. He's like, man, 7%, Pat, we got to do this. I'm like, I'm not doing this. So what do you mean you're not doing this? I'm telling you, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to do this for any amount they give us. That's not my brand. That's not what I believe in. What sort of products are you talking about? It, 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 it's a random product that, I mean, for me, if you told me right now for me to do alcohol, say, you know, uh, uh, I don't drink beer. Okay, I used to drink uh, uh, a good, uh, what do you call it? What was Blue Moon? I love Blue Moon. I don't drink beer. Um, I will have an old fashioned, okay? And if you ever have an old fashioned with me and they'll bring it, I'll have, I'm gonna have one fourth of it and that's it, okay? I have a glass of wine. If it's a nice super Tuscany wine, in my house, I got a few hundred thousand dollars worth, worth of alcohol. When you come to South Florida, we'll have you on and I'll, we'll have lunch at the house together. Yeah, yeah. You'll see. Tell me what I know about the alcohol. Nothing. And by the way, I tried to finish all the Jose Cuevo tequila when I was in the Army. Couldn't do it. I drank tequila every day. In the, and I'm telling you, that, that was me every single day. My fridge had the cheap $8 bottles of tequila that everybody would come and get. I was broke every month because that was my priority. That's funny. But, but the point is, like, we, we need to talk more. Like, Elon, uh, Dana gets up there and says, go screw it. Go F yourself. Go this. Like, Yeah. Backbone.
stand up and say no so, to some of the money. So I, I agree. Now, here's the question for, for most people, though, right? They don't have the hundreds of millions to be able to stand in that position. Not saying that you can't stand in that position yeah. without that money. Yeah. It is it is from a, a more, not that they just were given it or they just found themselves there. Like, obviously, they did a ton to get there. But people now who, are, let's say, are just working to figure it out, do you see why it's harder for them to stand and say, I fuck this because they kind of, maybe they got a job at Disneyland. You know what I'm saying? Or even during the where it was like, you can't go leave. to school here. Leave. Yeah, no, I just, leave. I want, yeah. We'll no, go the, into it. the answer is leave. Just leave. No, the, the, dude, that's why I said at the beginning when you said like 18 to 25, what do I do? Choose, look, so you know how every year we do business planning, okay? And when we're doing business planning. By the way, I'm only saying this because I know people will be like, what I about totally this? I totally get it, bro. Because I, I understand. I get what yeah, you're yeah. saying. But what, what I'm saying is like, you know, in life when we're doing business planning, and December is typically when we start planning for next year, like, okay. I'm going to do a life plan or a business plan. Okay, so what do you actually go through? I put something on Twitter today about the 10 things, right? Here's what I said. Number one, manage which friends, coworkers, and relatives influences you both negatively and positively. So, for example, when you go through this, make a list. Positive influence, negative influence. And if I spend this many hours a week with these guys and this many hours a week with these guys, Dude, I'm cutting this fat and I'm done. And the way you train your friends is in the following way. If you typically respond back to them within two minutes, because you know friends, you text them back within two minutes, respond back to them within six hours. Then the people you respond back to in six hours, move them into the 12-hour category. The people you respond back to in 12 hours, move them into the 24-hour category. You're talking about removing. Removing the negative people out of your life is yeah. one of the first things you got to do. So now watch. The second thing I have here on the, I won't go through the whole 10 thing, but I'll tell you the second thing, which is very, very important, is choose which circles you'd like to be in. Make a list and say, man, which, like I remember back in the days when I started creating content, I'm like, dude, who do I want to be? Like, okay, these are the guys that are here. I don't relate to this. I don't like his style. There's no, oh, blah, 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 blah. Boom. That's my guy. I relate yeah. to him. That's my kind of guy. Guess what? Some circle is going to take six months to get into, some 12 months. Some may take a decade to get into, right? Yeah. But today, the circle is also the company you work for. Go work for a company that you believe in their values and principles. Go work for an organization that you're willing to run through the wall for. Can you imagine you work for a company that you don't believe in what they believe in? Now, you may say, but I grew up loving Disney. It's not the same Disney. But I grew up loving, you know, what these guys stood for. It's not the same company. It's a very different company today. The founder is dead. It's not the same founder. So you got to go figure out a way to work with a community that you relate to. Because if you can, here's what it sounds like. For example, it, it, okay, I go home and I'm, they're like, so what do you do for them? I said, dude, I work for freaking Bradley Martin. What is it like? Freaking awesome guy. You know what this guy, let me show you. Here's what it's like. You know how I was looking? Let me tell you what happened to him when he was six years old. Here's what he went through. And I feel it because I know it's a pain and I feel it in his eyes. I love this guy. I freaking would do anything for this guy. So, are you serious? Now you go sell me your job. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah. No, bro, sell yeah. where you're working at. Sell your crew. Sell your gang. Sell your heritage. Sell your, like, one of the things that, when you think about people that say, I'm Puerto Rican, and let me tell you what, I'm Puerto Rican. I'm this, and I'm that, and I'm this. Good. You are, This whole concept about, well, it's not good that you know, you're know you proud American. and just, No, be a proud American. Be a proud Armenian. Be a proud Assyrian. Be a proud Irishman. I respect the fact that you are proud to be whoever you are. I respect that Muslims are proud Muslims. I wish many Christians were just as proud as being their religion as Muslims are. I respect the fact that you're proud. I respect the fact that you represent. You know how a player plays for a team and they love that team? And you know how players like, yeah, I'd like to be Trey, like Zion Williamson. You think he loves playing for freaking Pelicans? I own his best card. And, and I watch this guy play. I'm like, what an annoying guy to have on a team. I would never want to draft a guy like Zion Williamson. As excited, He's a guy that I actually believe could score 100 points in a game. He does not want to be on the Pelicans. He's being talked about his agent behind closed doors because he's trying to go to the Knicks. He's going to end up going to the Knicks. But you know what? He's not happy being at the Pelicans. Okay, fine. Then go for, well, play for the Knicks. But at least come through for the Knicks. But you see certain players that play for a team, and you see them, you're like, dude, this guy's a freaking true 49er. That guy's a true Laker. Like, you know, there's pride in that. Yeah. So 
again, going back to the answer to the question, if you're working at a place and it's not something you value, match their values and principles, go be somewhere you can be proud of. Well, this I, I guess the the dissolution of it comes back down to this tolerance thing, though, because like you know, you talk about the groups like you talk, you speak about Muslims being like, this is exactly how it's going to be. There's less, there le there's less wavering of tolerance of certain ideals, right? Whereas the other groups you're speaking about are there's they're more the tolerance is like it's more wavy and there's more like accepting of this and that. So because like there there has to be some level of tolerance and then there has to be some level of like line. So it's hard to go because everyone's so uniquely different, right? Like yeah. everyone gets to unique points in their life where it's like, okay, now I understand this because this happened to me and I learned from it. No, bro. They, no? I, I, like my opinion again. Look, so yeah, yeah. The thing about life is, it's gonna take us until we die to see what we were right. I may be a bad parent. We're gonna find out about thirty years. I say the way you judge if you were a great parent or not is when you have grandkids. If yeah. your grandkids do well, you were a great parent. So I'm probably never gonna find out if I'm a great parent. Because by the time my oldest kids have kids and they're 30 years old to be somebody, I'm not going to be around. So it's going to take a while to know who's right, who's wrong. Everything that I'm talking about here comes with a risk of being wrong, right? To me, um, is there areas to be tolerant with your kids? Like, no, you have to do the sport. Maybe he doesn't like it. Let him try two other sports. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. But is there to be tolerant with being disrespectful to the mom? No, zero. Is there tolerance in, you know, one time he, one of my uh, uh, kids talked to my nanny in a disrespect. I said, what, what are you doing? And I see my nanny's crying and she loves me. She's been with us for 14 years. She, she, I, I have my nanny living with us right now and her mom is sick. I moved her mom in here from Mexico. She lives with us right now as well on the second floor. We love, I brought a chiropractor yesterday, did adjustments on both of them. She's 85 years old. They're sitting there doing adjustments. Zev is a ridiculous chiropractor in Florida. But so he says something to my nanny. I said, Melva's crying. I said, I'm sorry, what did what'd she say, Melva? No, no, daddy, no, it's okay. I said, no, what did he say? I said, let's go to club room right now. He goes to the club room with me. I said, what do you think you're talking to like that? I said, do you know how many diapers she's shamed with? You know how many times you've peed on her? You know how many times you pooped on her? You know how many times she's fed you? What makes you think you can talk to this woman like this? I said, you know, in your life of people that have taken care of you, she's in the top four people in your life. Bro, you best bring respect to her. You do not get to talk to her like that ever for the rest of your life because you're going to have a problem with me. I'm not going to be tolerant there, bro. So when it comes down to values and principles, you cannot have tolerance because God forbid you give them this much, they will bully the hell out of you if you give them this much. Zero Tolerance when it comes down to values and principles. Now, am I uh, micromanaging this? I'm not. That's not my style. Like if you, if one of my direct reports, CFO, COO, whatever, they work for me, I'm like, hey, here's what I need from you. This is the expectation. You got 30 days to learn the system, get to know the people. This is what I want to see you do. Put your 30, 60, 90 days together. I need a weekly report being sent to me on Friday. What you did, what's the good, bad, ugly? What are your new hires? Who are you working with? How are the projects? Give me the project management. Monday morning, we go through 8.30 to 10.15, report to eight different companies I'm managing. How are we looking with Manek? What's going on with this year? What are we doing with that? How are we looking at with this? How much money are we spending on this? How's VT.com doing? Are the revenues up? What are we doing with the ads? What's the ROAS? Great, 10, 11, 10 15 to 11 o'clock. I have my insurance uh, accountability with my four direct C-suites, the CSO. The president gives me the report. The CTO gives me the report. Great. As long as you're doing your stuff and you're doing your thing, I'm not a micromanaging guy, but you cross the line with values and principles, I have zero tolerance for. So it is right to unpack what to be tolerant with, what not to be. Yeah. But dude, you cannot. Like you right now, a minute ago, I gave you all the money in the world. You, you have zero tolerance. That's no. the point. That's the values and principles. You know, and sometimes we're confused. I used to pray for four things, and I changed one of them. For, for since 1997, I've asked God for four things. Courage, wisdom, tolerance, understanding. I was an atheist for the first 25 years. From 18 to 25, I prayed just because in the army they sent me to be with this uh, camp at this house with like 20 of us, and we could play pool and jump in the lake, but every night we had to do Bible study with this old 75-year-old man or what, however old he was. Last day he gives me the Bible that his parents gave him December 24th, 1974. I have it till today. He says, son, you need this more than me. I said, trust me, I, I don't believe in God. He said, just trust me, you need this. I said, you're wasting your time giving it to me. He says, son... God told me to give it to you. You know how much that messes you up? 
You know, like, don't, don't do this to me, man. I don't believe in God. I saw war in Iran. I don't believe in no God. My parents got divorced twice from each other. I don't believe in God. Gives it to me. I walk my like, freaking hey. I just have to, I'm freaking, I got to be thinking about this all day long. So I start praying. I said, God, I don't believe you exist. But if you do, I'm going to talk to you like a friend. Here's what I'm going through today. This is what's happening here. And then I started praying for courage, wisdom, tolerance, understanding. Courage, because I'm going to be put into situations where I'm going to be scared and don't know how to handle it. God, give me courage. Wisdom, I will be leading people that are older than me. I need wisdom. Give me wisdom. Tolerance, because some people are going to be tough to work with. Understanding, to know that everyone's dealing with something. I need understanding. I need wisdom. I need courage. I am no longer praying for tolerance. I don't want to <laughs> Interesting. Today. I don't want it anymore. I stopped praying for it six months ago. Huh. Six months ago, I said, why just happened. six months ago? Hold on, let me let me go run to the bathroom real quick. I want to yeah, keep I'm talking good. about this. Go for it. All right, guys, quick interrupt for the podcast. Green Chef, the number one meal kit right now. Honestly, in the games. Check this out. It's really simple. Every single time I was ever like, okay, I'm gonna go like go to the grocery store and I'm gonna pick these meals out. Like honestly, like cooking is just really not my thing. I I can enjoy to cook. I don't really enjoy it too much, but Green Chef takes out all the guesswork. So when you're picking your food, right? They've already taken out all the guesswork. So when you're ordering it from them, instead of like me going and picking my food from the store and be like, oh, I'm gonna cook this, this, and this, you know, maybe it's not the way I really want it to be. They do all of that guesswork for you. So number one, you don't have to go to the store to get it. It's super convenient. Number two, it's already all done for you, right? So like you don't have to pick like, okay, I got to get this seasoning and that season and add this and add that. It's like all done for you. And they just kind of give you all the ingredients individually packaged. So you're just like, it's all there. Good to go. It's fresh. Everything is quality. Everything is like fresh. Everything is done for you. So you don't got to worry about like, is this going to taste good enough? Because they're going to walk you through the instructions how to do it really simple. So give them a shot. Green Chef. Also, it's December. Really important. Um, they have a special going on right now, which is dope. But at the same time, too, get you started early on your New Year's resolution. So if you're like, oh, I'm going to start in January, I promise you, yes, the training is so essential. Dieting is so essential. But like really knowing what you're doing, eating the right amount of food, all this stuff is just like probably the harder part, in my opinion, because honestly, the training is the funner part for most people. It's more fun. Like, obviously, it's hard. It's challenging. But for me, and I know for a lot of people that I've spoken to, the hardest part in all cases is always the nutrition. It's always like the back end. Like, am I drinking enough water? Am I eating enough food? Am I eating the right food? Green Chef is going to help you basically take all that guesswork out so that they just have it all done for you. It's all at your door. It's all in your fridge. It's all ready to go when you need it. So go to greenchef.com slash 60 raw talk, put in code 60 raw talk when you're checking out and you get 60% off. Plus right now they have a special plus another 20% for the next two months. Let's get back into this podcast. So, okay. This is, I love this. By the way, this is great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Man, don't choke on that water. <laughs> it's funny. You know, my mom, I swear, I swear to growing up, my mom would choke on water and I'd be like, what the, what are you doing? Yeah. And I started getting older. I was like, now it's happening I'm to me. Yeah. Choking on water, dude. <laughs> Just goes down the wrong pipe. But so let's talk about the tolerance thing. Yeah. Um, why did you stop? And I want to talk about the God thing and the atheism thing. Why did you stop praying for tolerance six months ago? Why did I stop praying for to tolerance? Yeah. Okay. Because I saw what was going on. And the more, like, sometimes when you pray for something, you know, I believe God puts you into a situation for you to be tolerant. I don't want you to put me in a situation anymore to have to be tolerant. So I don't want to be tolerant. I don't want to be tolerant when it comes down to certain things where society is trying to make me think it's normal. It's not. It's just not normal to me. It's not normal behavior. It's not a natural behavior. You know, some people have lived a different life and it's a tough life they've lived and they're choosing to do certain things because they're lost today. And you want me to be tolerant because a famous basketball player like Dwayne Wade's younger son wants to transition and his wife the mom is saying why don't we just wait until the kid is 18 years old no so he moves to california the wife was saying a, that yeah the wife's like no let's wait till 18 he's like no i'm moving to california so they come here and the kid transitions and and it's like what are you doing so now no here's what we have to say so because i can't live in florida i can't believe what florida stands for and doesn't let kids have access to this kind of stuff yeah i'm good you know i, I i'm not entertaining that and there's no fear of well, you know, why would you say something like that from Dwayne Wade? Wouldn't you like to have him on the podcast? I'm not going to compromise my values for that. Right. I would love to have a conversation with a guy like that. He would never do it because there's no way he's going to have questions like that being answered because the career path he's going, he wants to be a show host. He wants to be, you know, doing that. If you want to do that, those guys are expecting you to believe in a certain thing to get those cool points. No, 
I choose not to be tolerant, and I'm banking on a camp initially saying, you've lost your mind, you're crazy, you're unfair, you're this, and then long-term saying, holy shit, respect for having a backbone, and you were okay losing a few people initially, and long-term you gained the world. I'll do that. Yeah, I'll be well, this reminds me of the thing for me when I kept my gym open during the pandemic. It was like everyone was like, what the f*** are you doing? And then looking back, everyone's like, well, you did the right thing. Of course it's you just did the such right a thing. Weird, yeah. I such remember a, that. Such a weird thing. Like it's just, I I don't know. Is it just like you just innately feel like, oh, this is right? You just like certain things you just know. You just look at the situation for what it is. You know, like one of the best exercises you could do is everything to me. Like if you think about like, how do you judge a leader, right? Let's see. How do you judge a leader? Okay. Well, you know, he sets the example. That's one. What's two? You get people to do things they typically wouldn't do on their own. Okay. Like inspiration. Kind of. Okay, cool. So now, how do you measure somebody's leadership? Like, how do we give somebody a score? Who have they built? Who have they duplicated? Who came from the The reason why Jack Welch was known as a godfather of building leaders is because anybody that ever recruited an executive that worked under Jack Welch for six, 10 years, and you brought him to a different company, those guys were killers. Because if you can handle working under Jack Welch, for 10 years, and he fires the bottom 30% every year, guess what, Jack Welch, great leader, right? You go to you know, Andy Grove, who took Intel, I think they grew 100% every year for a freaking decade. Everybody in Silicon Valley, that was their god. Everybody, Jobs, everybody looked up to this guy. And there was this other guy named Bill Campbell, the Trillion Dollar Coach, very good book to read, Trillion Dollar Coach. But we judge people based on leaders they develop, okay? Eventually it's like, oh wow, look at that coach, Bill Walsh. He produced this guy, he produced that guy, he produced this guy. Respect. Oh, look at that coach. He produced this guy, he produced this guy. Okay, respect. Hey, look at John Wooden. Da -da. Respect. Why? What is what is building? What are you building? What, what, what is a Jack Welch building? Like, what are we measuring it on? It's based on habits, values, principles. That's what that is. It's habits, values, principles. So here's an exercise. It's December. They're going to see this thing in December, right? So 2024 is around the corner. Do you know what values and principles I can't buy you on? Like, what are you not willing to compromise? You're getting married, let's just say. Like, my, my wife and I were getting married on uh, our second date. I bought her a book called 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged. Story. Right? Good. Yeah. yeah. So I here, good. write this book. And I said, you know, I'm looking for a wife, not for a girlfriend. So one of the things on the list that I made is my three non negotiables. So guess what? It doesn't matter who the girl is. I'm not negotiating these three things. We have to have non-negotiables. You may have different non-negotiables than mine, but it's a non-negotiable, right? So you kind of write that down and say, this is what I want to do. Others might say, you're crazy, Bradley. Who would? You're so judgmental for having that as a non-negotiable. Are you marrying the girl? Right. Are, you, are you doing? I'm marrying the girl. This is my values and principles. So the exercise of taking an hour or two and writing out your own values and principles. The reason why we don't do this kind of stuff, because... Life is so chaotic and fast that we, we don't take a lot of timeouts. By the way, if you think about timeouts, we used to take a lot of timeouts pre-social media. We used to take a lot of timeouts. When do we take timeouts? We don't take timeouts anymore nowadays. It's just... Yeah. 85 know, years old. You know what's also really interesting? You kind of mentioned it like when you said the person being like, yo, you're, you're this, you're that. And it's like, yo, you're not the one marrying this one. It's me, right? You're, you're kind of like perspective on how you're going to move forward in the marriage or if it makes sense for you or not right you know what's also really interesting about today's world society internet is like i think a part of the reason why people fail to really stand on their values is because of the peanut gallery because so many people meaning meaning like nowadays you say like you're doing something let's say for example i'm like i post a picture let's say i post a picture of me and my girl or whatever right let's or me and my my wife to be, and let's say my wife does this for a living or she does that for a living. And it's, and let's say they, someone doesn't like it or someone doesn't like the perspective of it or the, the view of it. And you get all these reasons why like, Oh, this, she's this, or she's that, or she's weird, or she's this, or everything is a, a judgment zone now. So I think that's also a part of the reason why people, you know, if we, even if we talk about like, we were talking about like Dwayne Wade and it's, it's like, obviously he's choosing this and he's, he's, he's helping this, but He's trying to get the appeasal of like this side or whatever it is. And you, you still have this like world where it's like, 
even my friend, I said, you know, he can't post that he wanted this guy to win. He's got to post that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm saying like, we're in this spot in the world where like people are so, especially like people with the big microphones are so also judged and like ripped apart or, 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 you know, pointed at for like certain things or flaws that I think sometimes people are afraid that they could stand on their morals. Not that they can't, not that they shouldn't, but I think that's something that's like, besides just like, just genuinely, like you're talking about being able to work in a certain industry because you have to kind of like play a certain role to be able to be that, you know, TV, you know, guy, whatever the f But I think just even beyond that, like people are so afraid, I think of like judgment. And I think judgment has become so much more readily available just because of the internet. And I think people are just like, they're allowing what other, because innately humans are so about community, right? So if, if we're talking about like that psychological effect of, I, I want people to accept me. I want people to, to believe in me. And this goes for everything and all, all sort of rights is like, I think people are afraid of standing in places that maybe not everyone is supporting of. And like people still have this sort of this idea of like trying to please everyone. And I think that's how we've got to this point now where then now people are kind of being like, all right, enough is enough. This is how I feel. And it's interesting because, you know, we talk about the Elon Musk and standing up and saying, yo, fuck this and fuck these mm -hmm. advertisers, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you see the data and you see all these people being like, oh, I'm choosing this same thing. And I want to choose even the people who, because the data is being pushed by the people who aren't the people with the big plat the big platform and microphones. It's just the people choosing cancel subscription, not go here, not see the movie, mm -hmm. whatever it is, right? I just find the whole thing so interesting how like I notice it once Elon says it, right? Like you said, and then, you know, someone else will tweet about it. I tweet about it. A bunch of other people that I, I look at it, I, I like, I kind of like can be like, okay, oh, I relate to are also tweeting about it. And then like more and more people start to be like, huh, it's like this swing of what's acceptable versus what's not acceptable mm -hmm. is changing. But I think why it was so hard for so long is because like the, the judgment of like the readily quick, oh, you you're a fucking loser you're this you're a scumbag you're whatever and i think people are starting to get less intimidated of that i think but but like i think that's why a lot of people i don't know they don't stand so firmly on their value because they're afraid of being like well i don't want i don't want to tiptoe around this or maybe i have to tiptoe around this because i don't want that person to be offended like we've lost like like i said we've we've lost the i don't know just the fucking like this is what i believe this is what i feel and it's, we're trying to appease everyone. You know, the, the book Power Versus Force talks about uh, uh, what produces force and what produces power, right? And it explains the lowest level of, you know, <clears throat> consciousness for individuals is like apathy, guilt, grief, always feeling guilty about what you're doing. And it goes to, you know, anger, desire, all these things that you go through at the lower level. And in the first level of consciousness where you're neutral, you're coming up, it's courage. You have the courage to be wrong. Great. That's actually a good thing. I'm okay being wrong. I was wrong. Okay, the courage to be wrong. Then it goes, you have the willingness to have the conversation, the willingness. I'm willing to see if we can make this work. I'm willing to have the conversation. I'm willing to sit down. I'm willing. So it goes courage, willing. Uh, I think it's acceptance. I'm accepting the fact that we're different, but we're different. I'm accepting the fact that you're this. I'm accepting, okay? So it's courage, you know, uh, willingness, acceptance. Then I think it's reason. And then it goes to, you know, all these other levels, lo love, joy, and then enlightenment. And only two, three people, it says, it have reached the level of enlightenment. I think there's nothing wrong with me sitting there saying, look, I, I disagree with you, Dwayne Wade. Right. I, I disagree with you. It's just not my cup of tea, okay? And you want to yeah. do that? No problem. Salute. Good for you. I don't think it's right because statistically, are we okay with 12 year olds voting? Oh, hell no, they're 12 years old. But we're allowing them to vote on who they can be with their body. If the 12 year old can't vote for president, but they can vote to change their body, what are we talking about? Can a 12 year old buy cigarettes? No. Then why can't he do that? Can a 12. Why don't we let 12-year-olds do certain things? Can a 12-year-old get married to a 40-year-old man? Why not? Why can't we? So these are the things <laughs> where you actually go and say, nah, man, that's common sense. So it's not, I'm accepting right. the fact that you live by this. Then there's a part of it with the risk to say, 
Like, you know how you have a list of guys that you want to have on your podcast? And so what happens when you have a list of guys you want to have on your podcast? You'll go through your um, list of names and you'll say, man, I can't be critical about those guys. Why aren't you being critical? So I want him on the podcast. Cool. If you read the book with Elon Musk, the last chapter of it, uh, Elon Musk starts calling out Tim Cook. And then Larry Ellison, his mentor, when he's in Hawaii on one of his islands, says, hey, listen, choose your enemies wisely, man. Tim Cook's not an enemy to you. Stop saying Tim Cook's going to take you off the app. That's not a bad guy. That's a good guy. Go get to know him. And then Larry, you know, Elon Musk receives the feedback and goes and meets with Tim Cook. He's like, oh, shit. I actually like Tim Cook. You know, most people don't know Tim Cook's a gay Republican. He's a open gay CEO of the largest company in the world who went to the White House and meet with Trump. And when they asked him, they said, how come you came to the White House and you never came to the White House when Obama was here? He says, because Obama never invited me. I would have gone to whoever was the president. Here's a yeah. gay CEO of flipping Apple yeah. having a conversation. And now so Elon's like, yeah, you know what? Tim Cook's a cool guy. So sometimes it's just having a conversation and sitting and seeing who it is. But at the same time, you know, the, the fear of, you know, not being liked or not that guy will never do anything with me and that's my guy or that's this and that's that. You're being held hostage in we a certain kill way. That. Do, yeah, do, we have the to way, kill it. You know, the way I look at it is this. Here's how I look at it. You know how some, let's just say you have somebody that you really want to be friends with. Okay, like that I'd love to be boys with that guy. And then you go and you hang out with them and you realize you like him. You really like him. He doesn't like you. <laughs> okay so what do you do so you like him but he doesn't like you he's like he doesn't he's not feeling you what are you gonna do you're gonna change for him to like you no you just you're like okay by the way this has happened to me man it's happened to me last year yeah this happened to me a year before it happens to me every year and i'm like okay cool well before it's kind of like oh man but what do i need to do to win him over no i'm not anymore because i'm cool i understand who i am i understand what i'm about i understand what i want to build and I'm not in the begging business. I'm not in the business of begging for relationships and friendships. And if you don't value who I am and what I want to do, no problem. If you cut me off and you want to go elsewhere and you don't value me and you take advantage of me, it's the fastest way, the way for me to interpret it and say, no problem. You don't value this relationship. I'm totally okay with that. I don't take it personal. So there's this fear that we go through of being afraid of sometimes losing our, you know, those types of people. And, and that controls us. But at the end of the day, you know what will happen? Here's what's happening right now. How did you and I get linked up? Okay. I consume your content. Like, I don't know why I just like this guy. There's something about this guy's like, you know, Nate, I, I think I can kick your ass. It looks at you. Boom, you know, <laughs> I so love that one. Hey, I watch you. Okay, cool. I'm like, I like this guy. I like how he is. Okay. There's like, oh, you watch my content. Oh, interesting. Some of the stuff he says. And then what happens? I'm at your place now. How did this happen? Dude, we're, we're finding each other. And then it's like, okay, next time you're out, you come, you meet my family. Maybe you bring your girl. My wife meets your girl. Then you meet my kids. Then maybe one day you have kids. And then we're doing. And then it's like there's a relationship. Then there's trust. Then it's like, hey, man, can I talk to you about something? I'm going to, what do you think about this? Hey, what are you going to do for Christmas? Next thing you know, we're Christmas, we're in Aspen eight years from now. Having dinner, it's like we're at the same house. How the hell did the that's the thing about the fact that when when you're willing to go, hey, are you good at skiing? Terrible. Oh, I'm so good at I'm I'm so good at really. Yeah, no, sh grew no. Up doing it. Sorry, I interrupted. But no, 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 no. But listen, I'm entertaining to watch skiing, but that's a very <laughs> different thing. No, but this is the point. So when you go like this, these are my values and principles, okay? And then they're like, yeah, whatever. Probably it's not real. And it's like, these are my values and principles. You give another version of a story. This is me, open hand, open hand, open hand. Six, 12 months later, they're like, that's Bradley's values and principles. They know what happens. Then a group says, what an asshole, okay? And they used to like you. And a group says, what a freaking badass. The people that said, what a freaking badass are not gonna go tell 82 people about you and they used to only tell two people about you. That's the magic. Elon's got 160 million followers on Twitter. We started telling other people, this guy's a freaking badass. We used to only tell three people about Elon. Then it went to 
20 people of Adilah. Now yeah. it's like to everybody. What happened? Because he went like this. Yeah. And we said, fucking did. dude, I, I got your back. You're my kind of a guy, right? So that mindset, Bradley, is freaking liberating because you're going to find your gang, your army of people that are like minded like you that are going to make you feel safe and say, I'm not the only crazy one here. There's other people like me. Yeah. So, so if you're someone there searching for that, how do you find it? Just like what you finding other people and what you, like how we found it, I guess. You talk about it. Yeah. That's all you do. You talk about it. And the more you talk about it, people are going to share. Did you see what he said on this one podcast? Like, you know, like how we do it. Like, you know, like, Hey bro, watch this clip. Hey bro, watch this clip. But you and I don't know who's doing that. Do, do you know what I'm saying? What's like, happening outside. You and I don't know who's saying, did you watch this conversation with PBD and Bradley? Watch what I'm it's interesting what they talked about, right? Hey, look at this clip here. Look at this clip here. Look at this clip here. And then they're like, man, I'm starting to like Bradley more. Like I thought Bradley, I used to like, you know, I'm like starting to like Pat more because I'm very interesting. And that's what happened. But if you don't, like, you know how some people like, I'll do a podcast with somebody. And here's the way they answer. So what are your thoughts about what's going on here with this? Well, you know, I don't know. And da, 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 da. Eight minutes later, you're like, what the hell did he just say eight minutes later? No answer. No answer. Right. So then two hours later, I leave the podcast afterwards. I'm like, so how was that podcast, guys? I don't have a clue who this guy is. He just talked. But I don't know what he stands for. So get, And then you look at views. Boom, boom, boom. Wow, the audience. This guy, every time he talks, but he doesn't give any answer on what he stands for. Now, I bring another guy. Boom, boom, boom. boom screw him. Da, 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 da. Okay. Views. 1.2 million. Oh, now you like him because you, or you hate him, right? But at least you know what he stands for. So th there is an element of the more we're opening. And by the way, this doesn't mean we don't work on how we deliver our position. We don't work on how we deliver our message. We have to work on being persuasive, right? We can't just be like, this is a, you don't like it, screw you, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, no. It's also not, you know, there's an element of how to persuade and how to be gentle about it you know, on how to present your message, we got to be a smooth operator as well on how we're presenting who we are. Because a part of the, we, we put a scorecard the other day, we're doing a talent uh, uh, dinner. We had one last night, but we had one last month was very good. Last night's was what I expect all our talent to do going into 2024. But last month's, I created a scorecard and we put a bunch of 30, 40 people on, you know, podcast to score them. And everybody was on that list. Rogan's on that list. All these guys were on the list. And a part of it was why some of these guys are winning. So one was content. How wide, how deep can they go in content? This guy can only go deep on one topic. Everything else, he's narrow. He can only go three layers. That guy is wide two topics. He can talk money and he can talk whatever. And then he can go pretty deep. That guy is seven topics, but it's all three layers deep. It's no substance. The reason why Joe, Joe can go boom, boom, UFC, boom, comedy, boom, uh, boom, drugs, boom, health, boom, exercise, boom, John F. Kennedy assassination, boom, because he, so then all, boom, skyrocket, 94 countries, he's number one podcast on Spotify. Yeah. So then you go look at other guys and you'll notice a few other things. Then we looked at a uh, uh, multi, like, there's guys that are great interviewers. There's guys that are great um, giving opinions and feedback, okay? And then there's guys that are great entertainers. They're funny. You like their personality, right? So a guy that's a great interviewer, there's plenty of guys that are great interviewers on podcasts and YouTube, but nobody cares what they think because they, they have a format. They follow this 15 questions. They go on ChatGBT, what are the top 20 questions to ask? <laughs> that's corny. No, I know this sounds crazy, <laughs> so but corny. that's what they're doing, though. They're going on, like yesterday we did a podcast, and it's like the guy comes in, and he's looking at his computer, and he asked me the question. Okay, you know what's funny? I have, I literally prepare nothing. By the way, this guy's got 2 million. <laughs> I prepare nothing. The guy yesterday interview has 2 million subscribers. He's got 7.2 million followers on TikTok. That's, yeah. So it's not like it doesn't work. Yeah. But there's a format that's like that. Well, that right? specifically works for TikTok because you're only seeing clips. Right. Like you might watch that full interview and be like, the vibe's kind of weird. But if if it's just clip, because like that's another thing that's going on in today's social media, which wasn't even true three, well, yeah, three years ago kind of started. Five years ago wasn't even a thing. The last three years is clip culture of like 
some people don't even watch the whole podcast anymore. They don't even listen to the whole. They yep. just see a clip. Yep. So that person's banking off of just the formula. Of right. Like I could ask this question, get your answer, viral oh, clip. Yeah. But it's but you're right, exactly right because you're explaining. They're listening to it because of your answer. That's not right. Because of the interview. That's right. That's right. So so the in that's the that's a system, right? That's that's the question. The it's a good question he asked. Two is the answer. I want to know what Joe thinks. I want to know what this guy thinks. I want to know what that guy thinks. Yeah. What does he think? What does she think? Interesting. Okay. So now you're going there for the opinion. And then the other one is you're just going there because you just like the guy. Personality. Yeah. So the personality could be funny. Personality could be, you know, just, you know, a certain like hardcore aggressive. You like the personality because it's just straight up. You trust the guy. You. So those components, when you look at all these things in today's uh, outlet, and you're like, okay, there's a reason why some of these guys are doing good and some of these guys are not doing good. So the whole concept is to kind of weigh yourself, you know, if you want to kind of figure out a way to compete at a higher level and see who can go deeper levels and layers. And then the, the values and principle side with Joe or with other guys that are doing what they're doing, you'll say, man, I just relate to this guy. I agree with him. What he just, I agree with her. I agree with what we just said. Yeah, that's me right there. So then values and principles of the individual attracts you to them. They may be boring. Like they may talk like, so here's what I'm not willing to compromise when it comes down to my kids. God forbid if you try to get my kids to do X, Y, Z, you will see the worst side of me and here's why. So obviously he doesn't have the personality. Right. But his values are so deep, you don't give a shit if he doesn't have a personality. There's different ways we're finding each other. The entertainment stuff, it's short term. Because it's just like, this guy's fun. But the values and principle stuff, I want to spend time with this guy. Yeah. I want to run with this guy. I want to have a friendship with this guy. It's different. And, and by the way, this changes as you age as well. Like my 20s, I just, dude, are you good at going partying? Let's just freaking roll. Let's go. What are we doing, right? Then in your 30s, it changes like, ugh, you know, I don't. Then in your 40s, like, dude, I, I, I just, I don't have the time. I'm good, huh? Yeah. It's, it, yeah, it, my 30s, I'm already good. Yeah. I'm good. But because you did a lot of it early on, so it's I'm not like good. you missed out on anything. Yeah, I'm good. I'm so good. Did you have, do you have any crazy stories about like your your come up as far as like parties and stuff? These are more viral questions that I'm going to ask you now. I, I <laughs> like like what was the craziest? What was one of your craziest experiences that you've had in a, in, I mean, a, in a in like a a gathering setting? Did I mean I used to I used to drink a lot. I was a, I was a heavy duty. We would leave Kentucky, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and we'd go to this club. It was a gay club called Connections. Okay. okay? The best club in Nashville. It was underground. 2,000 people would show up. And if you go Google it, it shut down in 2003, 2004. And we knew we had 45 minutes to get plastered by the time we got to the club. So we would each finish a bottle of tequila on the way leaving Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Okay. And either my red Mitsubishi Eclipse Turbo and then or my friend's ranger ford ranger where we would put people in the back because we go with seven guys and you going over the bumps they're like freaking flying off and they're trying to hang it on for their lives and we'd go 45 minutes it's raining Shit, go fast i don't want the rain to hit me and then we'd get to connections and we are done we are done and then we'd go and we don't want to buy no 15 dollars drinks at this place and we all had nicknames in the army because you know when you're in the army you got uniform and you know, it's a whole different ball game. The gr girls love, obviously, men in uniform, especially in these places you live. And then we'd go to this club, Connections. It was Studio 54. Anything and everything went in front of everybody. So I want you to think about like a club where... Studio 54 in New York? Studio 54 was in New York. This is yeah. the Studio 54 of... Got it. Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. Got it. But the guy had one in Nashville, Tennessee, and the guy had one in um, Louisville, Tennessee, and uh, we preferred the one in Nashville, Tennessee, and it was unfair because you would go there, and girls that wanted to be left alone would go there with their girlfriends, and they knew nobody else would flirt, and <laughs> if you're the only one that's straight, you have a unfair was advantage. It was, was an incredible <laughs> oh, that's strategy, a, that's and funny. it was fantastic. The amount of wild stories we have, what we did there is... The guys that went with me know exactly what the stories are. We had a lot of them. Eventually, it's going to come out, and you know, I, I've, I've already told them. You know, some of the stuff is going to come out. I might have to explain myself, but we were we were hardcore partiers at that era. And then when I came out here, it was six days a week. I would take Mondays off. I was Tuesday through Sunday. 
partying and it was strategic the way it was. You would have to put like a saddle ranch on a Thursday or maybe replace that with a Dublin's or, you know, Miyagi's you would go to. And then you had to pick which Garden of Eden was typically good on Saturday. But if the crowd on Century Club was good on Saturday, maybe you would do that on Friday. Sometimes you just wanted to go to Palace because you wanted the different types of girls. Sunday, there was a pool hall that was slash a bar and a lounge. And so it was six days a week, six days a week, six days a week. And every other week, we would just go to Vegas. We'd drive up, come back on a Friday night, and we'd go to Dre's and, you know, all the stuff that they had going on. It was great parties. But for about a seven year, like Panama City, we used to go to Panama City uh, Club La Vila. You ever heard of Club La Vila or no? No. no. Panama City sounds amazing, though. If people have ever partied at Club La Vila and Spinnakers, they would know. Club La Vila had seven clubs within one club. And it's where MTV used to do their 4th of July, Labor Day, Memorial Day. Tens of thousands of people would come. It was insane. So hard body contests. And, you know, we'd go with a group of 20 army guys from the unit. And it was a mess. And we used to go with our guys, Felix and a bunch of other guys and Bradford and it was a it was a we Panama City was magical when we'd go there in the army they give you something called the Danza Danza is like a four or five day weekend and when Danza's came you're leaving Thursday night and you're going straight to Panama City It was a nine hour drive we'd go from Tennessee and we'd go down there okay we stay at Panama City one hotel room with like 10 guys because you're so broke like 69 bucks 89 bucks we're all chipping on like 10 dollars fighting over a couple dollars here and there but that was the that was the the forty five year old guy telling you stories of partying at eighteen, which is what seven twenty seven <laughs> shit twenty seven years ago. It's kind of weird, huh? That is crazy. <laughs> You're also really good at like family man answers. That was good. That is you didn't crazy. tell any crazy stories. No, Smart no, man. no. That, but you know, the, the, my boys when they get to a certain age, I'm going to tell them the answers. Of because, course. You know, father, my relationship when they get to a certain age, it's going to be a different kind of a relationship. S- super open book. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Do you, do you ever talk about um, drugs or anything like that? Do you, did you ever do any drugs? Do you ever I like- tried everything once. So I did half a pill of ecstasy. I hated it. wasn't I, for I, me. I, I, I couldn't I did stand it. it. I did it once, and I, I liked it, but it was like a thing that the next day I was like, yeah, I can't do that nah. often. So to me, ecstasy was like a no-go. Uh, I smoked weed the first time with this one girl, and I was 22 years old. She was my former boss at Bally's. <laughs> and I'm like... This is actually really good. I did it yeah. once at 22 for my personality because right, my right. personality is so hard. Trust me, I have family members that would love for me to smoke weed every day because I'm like nonstop. The last time I smoked, I drank uh, coffee was 25 years old. I can't drink coffee. Like, like I can't do Red Bull. And I saw this. I was about to drink it. No, no. And it's a caffeine. gym weed energy. I'm like, I can't do it. I'm, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm naturally, you know, on fires. I don't need any coffee. But uh, you don't drink caffeine. Zero coffee. Wow. Zero. I. It's not. You take any stimulants? No. Zero. Wow. And by the way, I'm I'm not on TRT. My skin doesn't respond well to TRT. So I tried TRT for six weeks. I broke out. I can't do really? TRT. Yeah. I can't do. Uh. Uh. uh I did the whole. Uh, uh. What do you call it? The peptides and all that mm-hmm. stuff. My body didn't respond to the peptides. It was fine. But the TRT, I, I, it would respond to. When I was 21 years old, I did a six week cycle of Primo. And the body did very well with Primo, Primo Ballum, back in yeah, the days yeah, when I was yeah. uh, 21. And then, uh, yeah, and then I used to, uh, 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 you know, work for a guy for a couple of weeks. We spent time together, and I did two lines of Coke once. Yeah. And then that's when I realized that's the one that I can never touch. Bro, that. I did never co- touch. I did Coke once and was like, th- that was one of the scariest, like, no. feelings. Because I was already, so like you said, I mean, I drink caffeine, but... Stimulants in general, if I do too much, it's like I'm having a really bad like yeah. time, like really anxious. And by the way, when I went to Mr. Olympia when I was 21 years old and I hung out with these guys and they were open enough with me to say, I said, listen, I, I want to compete. Like, first of all, you're too tall for this game. You, you're 6'3", 6'4". <laughs> yeah. You got to be like 300 height. plus pounds. You got, and I don't want to be off season because yeah. there's too much uh, pressure on the heart. And, you know, you have to use what they're, they're kind of telling me. Here's what you got. I'm like, no, nah, man. My, by the way, my kids and I, my um we talked about steroids with my uh, son the other day. And Dylan says, so dad, what do you think about steroids? I said, how old is he? 10 years old. I said, Holy all, shit. what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so, you, you know, I didn't react that way. But I'm like, so tell me why steroids? It's like, well, I was watching a documentary with Arnold. And I'm watching this, 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 dad. So, like, okay. So, I feed him all these documentaries. So, he's kind of like, makes sense. So, he sees a steroids conversation. I said, so what do you think about it? He says, do people do it? So yeah, a lot of people do it. 
what do you think about it, Dad? I said, okay, let me really think about this answer for you. This is interesting. I said, the only time you and I can have a conversation to entertain it, if you're actually doing it to want to be Mr. Olympia, or you're professionally competing for something that is legal to do so in that space. Aside from that, and if your body needs to recover, you have an injury and the doctor recommends it, great. Of course, the other thing is when in your 50s, 60s, I'm not going to have that conversation with him. Now, he'll know that later on. If he wants to do something, I'm sure doctors going to change it up with the way to do it, that the controls are going to be better. And nowadays, I got so many different ways to measure things with health. But I said, that's, that's the way. Aside from that, you don't have a need for it. He says, okay, cool. Boom, conversation done. I said, do you want to be Mr. Olympia champion? No. I said, then forget about it. He says, you know what? You're right. Great. Yeah. Just kind of like. It's interesting now. It's like a lot of people do it because just they, I think because the, the popularity of the fitness industry on social media, because it's, it's one of the bigger kind of like, uh, you I get guess more genres. likes. You, you, you know, it's also a good, you know, attention. It looks good, you know. But it, it, there's some, some guys, like I had a friend of mine that was on everything, Sasan and 250. He's doing DECA. He's doing this. He's doing that. But he wasn't training. You know, he would go once or twice. I said, what are you doing to your body? He said, well, you know, and he looked like the water bloated type big, you know, the one where you know it's not like a guy that takes this thing seriously. And those guys are clowns when you do it like that, just to do it. But then there's the guys that are the scientists who are training, who are going and getting their blood work every month and who are doing it professionally and they're figuring out a way. Uh, like, for example, for me, okay, this is my opinion. People don't like my opinion on this and I always get shit for this. I think Barry Bonds belongs in, uh, in the Hall of Fame. I think Mark McGuire belongs in the Hall of Fame. The no, no, one, of course they do. Yeah, it belongs in the Hall of Fame. I think... Those two guys, like what Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa did to freaking save baseball in 1998. Are you kidding me? I watched the highlights last week with my kids, and I'm looking at them. I'm like, Daddy, I want to see the 60th home run when McGuire hit it. Boom. I want to see the 61st when he tired Maris. Boom. I want to watch the 62nd when he picks up his son. Boom. I want to watch the 70th. Then we went and watched Barry Bonds a 71st when he broke the record. Then 73rd when he hits in the water and the guys chasing up. The, the, uh, people are running after it. You mean to tell me those, those guys don't belong in it? Really? Like, you think steroids is going to make those guys see the ball faster? You think it's, you, you think when Mark McGuire in his rookie year, when he was a toothpick, he had 49 home runs, he doesn't know how to hit the ball? You think when Barry Bonds hit those 40 home runs for the first half of his career and was a 40 40 guy and he did what? You don't think he belongs in the Hall of Fame? So to me, there's certain aspects of my libertarian side that's kind of like, like LeBron James, a lot of people think he's on GH, right? There's a story came out about LeBron Why James' wife. Why would he not be? Did you see about the story about LeBron no, James' wife? I've none of this, no. All right, another quick interruption for the podcast, BetterHelp. I've talked about this many times. It never is not important to talk about. Talk therapy specifically that you can do from the comfort of your home, okay? So it takes out, you know, any sort of, uh, you know, excuses you might have to going to a place, maybe it's too far away. Oftentimes, maybe it's too, too expensive, but you have all the reasons why you guys can do it now. You guys can check it out right now. You go to betterhelp.com. And honestly, I'm just telling you straight up, like man to man, person to person. I don't know who you are on the other side of the camera, but if you have ever considered it, I think it's a good idea to actually go along and go through with it. And BetterHelp is probably one of the easier ways to do it, to try it, to see if it's effective for you. Uh, you don't really lose much you know, it's it's not crazy expensive. It's not like going to like a traditional therapist might cost you a lot more. So give it a shot. It could give you great, great benefit. Um, you never know. So I, I just say like, don't be afraid of going and sharing your thoughts and sharing your mind with an unbiased person from an unbiased perspective to give you sort of insight, maybe some guidance so you could figure out some new shit so you can go in, in the direction of your life that you really want to go and kind of stop going down the direction that you don't want to go. So go to BetterHelp, better H E L P dot com slash raw talk at 10% off your first month right now. Again, that's better H E L P dot com slash raw talk. Let's get back into this podcast. The story about LeBron James's wife that she buys this stuff. When is that recent? To him a month ago. I was just talking about, yeah. it's so funny about a more than a little more than a month ago. I was having a conversation with Wade, my buddy, who's a, a sports commentator. Yeah. And we were talking about steroids and sports in general and all this. Then he would stuff. know the story. He well, I guess that it must have came after. I think I had that conversation about LeBron James being on steroids literally yeah. before this story came out because I haven't seen the story. 
But I was literally saying how, why would he not be on steroids? Yes. And we were, and I was talking about steroids uses in sports, just in, in, in general. And, and the, the conclusion that I kind of came down to in that, when was this? Let's see. <laughs> I mean, it's like, but it makes sense. Like, why, why would he not be, I mean, his age, all these things. It's like, it's not like Sarah is going to make him be more finesse on the court. You know, like they're just going to allow him to perform at yes, a higher so level longer. I don't have any problem with that. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Yeah. So I think that the only time I, I realized after having my conversation with Wade was like, I think in combat sports, it could be a little bit tougher because in combat sports, obviously there's recovery and all the stuff that's necessary, but it's just like hitting someone with more strength and more speed, like could be, if we're talking about not everyone with the same sort of capabilities. A lot of them are using, not all of no, them. No, I believe it. That's a lot what I'm of them are using. And by the way, you see the criticism when they give each other, right? Well, this, this, that, and you know, and back in the days, you ever seen the interview with Hank Aaron? Uh, I want to say it was with Brian, Go I don't know who it was, but it's Hank Aaron and Willie Mays. And they said, what did you use back in the days when you used to play? And Hank Aaron's answer, who owned the record for most home runs in Major League Baseball, he says, if I could use steroids, I would have used it. We used everything they gave us. That's what Hank Aaron said. Yeah. So now he played in the 60s and the 70s, so it's a different era we're talking about that he played. This thing keeps vibrating. He, he played in the 60s and the 70s, which is a different era, but even Hank Aaron's like, I would use anything if they would have given it to me, right? So in that level, you're just looking for a competitive edge. If you're professional, yeah. if you're professional, that's my opinion, you know, on how you ought to look at that stuff. But so now, you think LeBron's taking, I think. Let's do over under. I'll say 90%. Yeah. I'll say 90%. Yeah. I'll I mean, say the same shit. Yeah, 90%. And by the way, in the army, I had this guy named Jackson at the unit. The guy, every time, like one night I'm doing guard duty and he says, hey, but David. I'm going to smoke some tonight with the boys in the barracks. I'm like, Jackson, I'm on guard duty, bro. Don't do this to me. You know who's on guard duty? The other sergeant who's going to come to your room because everybody thinks you smoke. Dog, you got to get me tonight. I said, Jackson, don't do this to me, bro. He says, tell him I'm not smoking. Okay, here we go. It's midnight. But David, I'm coming over to check on the barracks. Holy shit. So I said, let's start off with HHC first. Let's go to Charlie Company. Let's go to Bravo Company. I'm trying to make sure he changes his mind to come to see Jackson's barracks. <laughs> and then he wants to go to Jackson's barracks. So I have to get distract this guy, run to the side and go to Jackson and say, turn on 80 incense and open the windows because it freaking smells everywhere. It's like, oh, shit. Start turning all this stuff down. How much trouble do you get? I get in trouble because I'm on guard if I back him up. How right? much trouble would they get? Oh, he, he got he eventually, a couple months later, he got caught. And he, he, he went from E4 to E1. And then he got out of the army. So he lost, he lost all his rank. Oh, shit. Yeah, he lost all his rank. So anyways, we go into the room. And he knocks on. He says, you smell that? I said, smell what? You don't smell that? I said, go, Sarge, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> he said, no, you know you smell that, but David. I know you smell that. You know Jackson smokes. I said, I've never seen him smoke weed. So we go in. And... Jackson, open the door. Open. What's up, Sarge? <laughs> oh, my God. You high? Nah. You're not smoking weed? No. What's that smell? Oh, it's incense, Sarge. He comes and he's looking around. They've hit everything. And for five minutes, the guy's asking questions. They're all so paranoid. You see all the munchies, the chips, everything sitting around. I'm like, Sarge, Jackson's a change, man. You know, he's this, he's that. We leave, and then they, they kick, uh, you know, Jackson out of the Army, and then the rest is history, right? But what were we talking about for me to prompt up telling this story? There was a point I was going to make to you about uh, um, uh, what were we talking about prior to this? We were talking about LeBron James, taking steroids, GH, yeah. taking steroids, and then I led to the Jackson story. I was going to make a point with this one here. Something with drugs to be yeah no i you know again for me with a guy I'll, I'll think about it but a guy like lebron at that level to be competing thirty nine thousand points he just crossed he's about to cross forty thousand yeah, points he's gonna history. play with his kids they're showing vince carter in his 21st season was averaging 17 minutes this guy's averaging 33 minutes it's insane it's insane so guess what you're probably doing something to take care of your body that can manage this level of activity but you know, if the NBA decides to expose him and he gets caught, can you imagine like he becomes the Barry Bonds of uh, basketball? I think he's worth way too much money to Nike. 
for them to let that happen. I think he's also a guy that um, plays by the rules where Barry Bonds didn't. Barry was an asshole. Barry Bonds was an asshole. Uh, a lot of the guys that didn't play by the rules, they destroyed their careers. Pete Rose didn't play by the rules. They destroyed his career, okay? He belongs in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Mark McGuire belongs in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I, I, I just think th this whole conversation about, like, steroids and sports, like, obviously, to going back to what you were talking to with your son, I think if there's a clear directive in, like, what you're doing it, what you're doing, how you're doing it, like, are you being safe, then it's like, okay, do you have, like, a specific goal in mind, or is it just you're just doing it because you want to look better? Then it's like you're kind of you're kind of fucked unless you have like a very clear directive. I yeah, think. you know, some of the people right now are like, "Well, my testosterone level is low, and that's why I'm juicing." But there's but, so many reasons why it could be low. Uh, yeah, there's right. so many reasons why it could be low. So, right? so you go to do the do the testing. What's your score? I'm at 600. The doc said if they put me on TRT, I'll be at 1200. 600 is good. What, what are you What are you talking about? You're 42 years old. You're well. I, I want to get my levels at 1200. I had a friend of mine who uh, I'm, I may see him tonight who did steroids straight nonstop for 10 years straight, nonstop, no off, no cycles, 90 day, taking 12 weeks off, straight 12, 12 uh, uh, 10 years. And he was chiseled. This guy was always a very good fighter. 10 years later, um, he decides to get off and we're at a game. I said, how you doing? He says, not good, bro. I said, what's up? He says, can I talk to you like a brother? Yeah, what's up? Can't get it up. So what do you mean? He said, I've been off juice for about six weeks. I said, what do you mean can't get it up? Even if I use, you know, Viagra, if I take some, I can't get it up. What are you talking about? Yes. He went through hardcore depression for six months for him to go through that entire cycle. And did he do things to get back to normal? He did. He did. Yeah. He did. A hundred percent. And not using HCG or, you know, all this other stuff. Just He just went, no Novadex, you know, worried about his, you know, all these things. He got back to normal six months later. Wait, he didn't use those things? While he was juicing, he was. When While he, he got was, off, he just stopped everything? He just stopped everything. Well, that's the where You got to kind of. I get that. Yeah. Well, he didn't. He just went cold turkey. Okay. Yeah. And he says, I'm done, done. 100% done, done. And he felt it for a good six months. It was very nasty. you like, very tough on him, on his marriage, but then with proper working with the doctor, everything, he didn't want to get back on it ever again. His body frame got obviously very small. You could tell when you looked at him, but you know, he's at a different phase of his life. He's my age and he's like, nah, I'm good. I don't need to do this. And now he lives a very different life that he wants to do everything to be organic and this, 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 and that. Marriage is great. He's happy. Family's great. Kids are doing great. But you know, there is the highly obsessive people that take things to a whole different level, that there's repercussions to that. You just have to know that there's some consequences with that when it comes down to yeah. steroids. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I just think, like, if we're talking about this, like, it, it should definitely not go without being said that if anyone is considering or does consider this sort of stuff, like, you, you need to make sure that you're getting your blood work done before to see what's going on before you ever kind of even start to start to experience it. And then throughout so that you can make sure that you're healthy throughout. I just think that's always important to tell anyone who's going to, because like once we talk about it, people are going to think about it. And I just want to make sure if anyone's actually considering this sort of stuff, you need to make sure you're healthy before you ever do it. And you need to make sure you're healthy throughout. You know, you know what it. feedback I would give with that? That's good feedback. I would also give this train natural for five years first. Of course. Well, that's go, a, go that should years. be like, yeah, that's, you know, you know, that should be, Given. But you know why, though? Like, it, Well, because you don't know what works for you yet. That's right. You don't even know if you drink enough water, you get enough sleep. Yeah. There's so many things that like you need to do. Go natural before. for five years. Yeah. Go natural and, and maybe... Well, should be minimum. You should be training for at least five years before you ever consider that. And, and the reason why for that with my POV is, point of view is, do you like working out? Like, do you actually like it? Do you enjoy it? If you're willing to do five years of training without anything... It's more of a lifestyle. Now, what do you want to do later on? Then go talk to a doc if you do want to do it. And by that time, you may change your mind. You may not even want to do it. But I think a lot of people are, the mistake they're making is they're coming out. They're like, I'm going to get on cycle. No. Well, they're looking yeah. for the fasting. No, that's not going to work. Yeah. That's not going to work. You look, and by the way, in the bodybuilding world, you can look at a person's physique and say, that's, that's a, that guy's he, he doesn't have a real body. 
And you can look at somebody and say, I don't care what that guy's on. That guy's been training for a long time. He's got a real physique. And whatever you put on top of it is fine. But, you know, the, the physique and the proper training that that guy's put into for those many years. Like, for example, Ronnie Coleman. I had him on the podcast. And Ronnie says, man, I used to compete naturally for a decade. I don't, I don't know if you remember Ronnie Coleman's physique when he was younger. Yeah, yeah, I had him on too. Okay, so amazing, amazing like, physique. But it's just that's the thing about even just steroids, this whole conversation in general is like people with these like sort of incredible genetics are like with or without are going to, you're going to be like, oh, shit. and then I think that's an interesting part of it all too is that like there's people who I've known in my life who have like taken it and then they just, you know, like tons of people like this who took it and were like, Oh, this is not exactly at all what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like this, like, you know, like you say, I get rich quick, like get jack fast. Like, and you will see improvement, but like everyone thinks they're going to get on and be like, I'm going to look like fuck Coleman. It's like, yo, know, there's just some genetic freak that like beyond just straight genetics, like out the, out the womb, also the work ethic and everything that they have that like, you just can't recreate. You can do your best. But I, I think like when we talk about this five year thing and the steroid and just jumping to that like level, people forget that like, are you sleeping enough? Are you drinking enough water? Are you eating enough food? Have you been training the proper way for long enough to see what you can do already? Most people are not doing that nowadays because I'll get questions. People, kids will come up to me in my gym. I have this gym over here in uh, Encino. And uh, they'll they'll be like, yo, I'm thinking about doing trend. And I'm like, first of all, that's stupid as f Which is like the most hardcore steroid you could ever take, right? And I'm like, how long have you been training for? Two years. I'm like, how long? But how long have you been consistent for? six months and it's just like it's like where wow well, and mm -hmm. it's a weird thing because it's it's another thing that goes back to the whole internet thing and the whole like who are you who are you emulating right yeah. you're just finding people who are going viral because they, they look a certain way and you could assume oh they're doing this so then you go oh i'm gonna do that because he has this and i want that and then they miss all the other stuff that actually like is probably even the foundation of that person that they're emulating because you only see you know the, the big lift or the jacked body but you don't see the whole built foundation that's that's been there so that's another problem with the internet just in general related not just the steroid conversation but all this kind of shit, right so you know you know uh, like f four years ago three years ago three years ago i met with the ceo of uh, mr olympia and i made an offer to buy mr olympia because i wanted to buy mr olympia yeah this was three months or four months before jake wood buys mr olympia and my idea from wanting to buy Mr. Olympia was... Was it Rock going to buy Mr. Olympia? I think The Rock was going to buy Mr. Yeah. Olympia. Yeah, Rock and, and uh, yeah, him and uh, Danny Garcia, Garcia were going to buy Mr. Yeah. Olympia. And they were all involved and they were getting in and all this stuff. And I think Mr. Olympia made a mistake not selling it to The Rock. It would have been great for The Rock to buy Mr. Olympia yeah. for the brand. The bodybuilders would have much rather have The Rock buy Mr. Olympia. Anyways, so what I wanted to do with Mr. Olympia was flip it. Meaning, like, you know, C-Bum right now, who Christopher Bumstead, who's yeah. got this incredible freaking physique. What a physique this guy's got, right? Yeah. 22 million followers on Instagram. And he's just a, hey, man, I appreciate it. You know, thank you. And the way he talks. You see how this guy talks? Yeah. Right? No, I know. He's a super chill, like, likable guy. I messaging him the other day. I'm like, hey, you know, um, are you coming out to Miami for Art Basel? I'm putting an event ticket at the Soho Beach, you know, house rooftop and... We have a bunch of people there, and I'm, I want to invite you. He says, man, I'd love to, but I'm doing what I'm doing with Turkey and all this stuff, and I can't. I'm like, w w w and he says, I'm getting my hair done because I want to look younger again. And today he posts a video on yeah, Instagram yeah, that he got it. his hair done in Turkey. I saw it. So he's like, you know what? He's just a, that's why he's so liked. I said, no wonder people love this guy, right? But so he is 6'1", 235, right? And he doesn't compete in a main Mr. Olympia. He competes in the other one. Classic. Classic. He right. doesn't go compete with the bigger guys. Open bodybuilding. Yeah. He goes and competes with the classic. Well, guess what? What if Mr. Olympia changed actually the standards and it's no longer about who's the biggest or who's this? What if we actually used AI? What if we actually used data and symmetry and we put it on a system and who has the best symmetrical Dan, you know, Frank Zane type of a Serge Nubre, you know, an Arnold type of a physique? What if we made that? look the look to win mr olympia instead of the freaking jean pierre fuchs or paul delette or all these guys that were coming out you know 200. yeah i think that's what they tried to do with classic physique but but i think it's still leaving the other biggest the reason why so many guys are dying and these guys are dying at, in their in their early 
uh, 40s, late 30s, because they feel like they have to put so many things in to be able to compete at the highest level and they're getting crushed. If they change the incentives, my opinion, if they change the incentives, um, I think it would be a different story with, like even right now, the Miss Universe. We made an offer to buy Miss Universe. You know Miss Universe, the guy that bought Miss Universe? You know who owns Miss Universe right now? No. Miss Universe is a brand that's been around for 72 years. And the person that bought it is a guy who is a transgender from Thailand who gets up and says, Miss Universe is for women, owned by a trans woman, and all the stuff that completely, that. okay, completely shit show. And he is in bankruptcy right now. He bought it for 20 million, can't make the payments. This stuff is written out all over the place. So I made an offer. I said, I'm interested in buying Miss Universe. What would I do if I buy Miss Universe? You know what the opening would be? Tonight, we're here to celebrate women. Tonight, we're, cel we're here to celebrate women, their leadership, their feminine side, why men love women, what they bring to us. Both men and women around the world are going to be able to appreciate women who were born women. And we're going to celebrate their beauty, their heritage, their pride, their background, what their country's all about. And we'll be able to do that for the next few hours. Having said that, please help me bring up the host, and the girl comes up and runs the show. And messaging becomes about the power of feminine women. Not confusing young kids. They're like, one day I want to be like that guy yeah. that owns Miss Universe. So to me, everything's about changing incentives. If you change the incentives, the behavior changes. If the incentive is about who's the biggest guy, well, then I'm going to do everything I can to be the biggest guy. And also in the Open Bodybuilding versus Classic, the, the, even this, the prize incentives, like there's still the most money being paid to open bodybuilders. Is it the 450000 or four? Yeah, the, yeah, and then it's like I think Chris, I think Chris made 50000 which obviously he makes a lot more. What did, what did they call it? Open? Open Bodybuilding versus Classic Physique. So, so what Chris is doing is open? Chris open. is Classic Physique. Open is like is bodybuilding as we know that, you know, kind of like I would – what had been for so many years, the freaks, yeah. you know, the biggest guys, Classic. is the is the higher, is the higher amount, much much higher amount, fifty thousand. Yeah, well, granted, You're Chris, right. it's fifty thousand dollars. Yes, I mean that, that's did the you problem. It? Yeah, fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Exactly. That's embarrassing. Yeah. Well, the guys got a nicer physique. Than well, it's 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 they haven't caught up yet because if you really look at it, the fact that you said Chris Chris Bumstead has twenty two million followers and. Probably all those bodybuilders who compete in open combined probably have as many followers as Chris himself. So they haven't caught up to the times, in my opinion. The, the Olympia I'm thing needs you. to be updated. I'm, where I'm it's totally like, with you. And by the way, guess what? It would change the game. So well, what if yeah. they change the comp? So imagine they change the comp. They give the 450 to these guys That's and they it, give the 50 I mean, to the well, other guys. Because here's the deal, right? If we just said Chris has 22 wow, million I had no idea. and all these other guys have X amount, right? Yeah. Who's drawing the people there? It's Chris. It's that category. Like I even go look at those people and like the engagement and all this stuff. It's like it's exponential compared to not. And this is not taking anything away from the open bodybuilders. You know the guys who who've gone to those extreme levels. Oh, I congratulate the guy that won. It's He's insane. A, seems like a really nice guy. But it's yeah. just like we we also have to go like who's drawing the traffic now at this point? People are coming to see Chris Bumstead and the people that he's competing against. The right, waist a small waist and a beautiful back and body is it's a, it's a big body, but it's not like. You know, you're 265, 6'3", six, yeah. right? He's 6'1", 235. Yeah. So that that's, that's uh, uh, you know, he, by the way, even the number two guy's got a beautiful physique, right? Yeah, he looks amazing. He looks amazing. He's a, some South American guy. I, I don't Brazilian. know where he's from. When I look at his physique, I'm like... Dino. He's very close to being able to yeah, win. I, I don't thought know, he was going to win. I thought so as well when yeah, I watched him. Yeah, he looks fucking good. Yeah, he looked really good. So, but again, you know, you see that, you're like, that's a that's a... Beautiful physique, you know. That's when Joe Weider would look look at these physiques and Sergio Olivia. You would see the small waist. That was the thing. Today it's a yeah, it's yeah. a different ball. But game. it's changing. I just think like this. Everything hasn't caught up with it yet. But it's interesting because remember we were talking earlier about people choosing, right? Who's voting? Yep. Who's getting yep. rid. Of, yep. It's the same thing. Like I said, you could just look at the follower count, the engagement count of these people versus like the other bodybuilders. There's not the engagement. Not, maybe because they're not posting as much lifestyle stuff. Maybe because they're not as open as like you know the hair stuff, what we're talking about. But just take all that away from it. We just if you just look at the numbers and the data, it's saying that people are looking at that more than they're looking at this. So why wouldn't the incentives to the people who are showing up and drawing the traffic go more money to the people who are 
bringing the larger audience. I just don't know why it hasn't gone that way. I think because they're still they still want to hold it to that sort of like um, level. Who, which who's, I don't. Who's your favorite guy? Who's your favorite physique of all time? Of all time. Of all time. I got to go with Arnold. You do. Yeah, who's Arnold. You? Arnold Zane. Zane too. Yeah. And Serge had a great physique too, but like, like I said, those are all those are all the older guys. Yeah. And then and then also two of the newer guys. Obviously, I liked Ronnie because it was so absurd, but Flex Wheeler. So he was like right there before, which is interesting because he never won an Olympia because Ronnie yeah. came in, but he was right there before Ronnie like just took over and won every single Olympia. But his physique, like I think it was 86 or 93, one of those, one of those, maybe 93, one of the craziest physiques of all time. That picture, that one picture he's looking down that almost doesn't yes. look real. Yeah, he's like that. Yeah, it just does not yeah. look real. That that's that was the physique that when I was like, oh, I want to get into bodybuilding, that was the physique oh, I was like, I, I love I, this. Like, he got a lot of guys. You know whose physique I like? I like Kevin LeBron's physique as well. Yeah. Do you remember Kevin LeBron? Absolutely. He had a very, you know, uh, uh, very interesting physique. It was different than everybody else. It was... You had the Nasserol somebody. You had the Dorian Yates, who was a machine. You had all these guys, but I like Kevin's physique, and because we we've been talking, because you know I did all these bodybuilding interviews, and then when they didn't sell me Mr. Olympia, I'm like I'm not I'm done doing any Mr. Olympia interviews. I don't have any interest because I was doing it because I wanted to buy the brand, and well, then I'm like, you should buy it for sure, huh? You should buy it. Oh, I would I would have loved to, but at this point, I have zero interest today. Yeah, I have Why? zero interest today. Today, I don't have any in interest today. Zero. So I had a meeting uh, last week when it was a meeting. I had a meeting last week. It was me, you, a, a few of our guys in a room, and they're pitching me saying, hey, Pat, this uh, company that's doing boxing, you know, I, I say we go invest into this company. We can turn this into a $100 million a year company. And da, 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 da. I, said, I said, guys, I think I have to have this conversation with you guys. I said, I am only interested with businesses we invest in today that start with the letter B. If it doesn't have the letter B in it, I am not interested anymore because it takes the same amount of comp effort to build a half a billion dollar company, $250 million company, as it takes to build a $5 billion company. The only difference is the $5 billion company is solving a bigger problem than the guy that's doing a quarter million dollars or half a billion dollars. So I'm not interested anymore. So I'm not, what are we going to do with this thing? Yeah, but we could sell it for $200 million. Not interested. Everything's got, like Minect, where we built Minect app. Minect, um, Seven years ago, I'm talking to my lawyer, and my lawyer, uh, uh, we have a seven-minute call. He bills me for 30 minutes. I get pissed off. I call him. I said, dude, what are you doing? It's a <laughs> seven-minute call. What are you doing billing me for 30 minutes? He said, well, the minutes roll up. I said, not to 30 minutes. You mean I paid 23 minutes for? No. I said, I want to pay you by the minute. What do you charge by the minute? He said, no lawyer charges by the minute. Can't you just do I, the math? And yeah. No, he, well, he, lawyers don't do that. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build a platform one day where I get to pay people by the minute. So, hey, do you have a minute to connect? Let's connect. So on connect, you know how people DM you left and right? You can't get back to everybody. Yeah. Or they want you to do video. So now on connect, when somebody DMs you, they have to pay you to get a response back. And you dictate your price. You can say 100 bucks, 200 bucks, 50 bucks, 80 bucks, 500 bucks. So I ask you a question. You respond back. You get 80%. Manek keeps 20%. If they want a video from you, you put a double the price. And then if I want to do FaceTime with you, literally, they pay to have a FaceTime with you. They pay by the minute. So if I want to have a 30-minute conversation with you, you may say, 30-minute conversation, I'm not going to do anything less than 50 bucks a minute. Okay, great. So that means I got to pay you what? 50 times 30 minutes, 1,500 bucks. You keep 80% there, and you have that call with them. And then 15 minutes later, they're like, hey, can we go for 15 more minutes? Uh, yeah. Okay, boom, I'll buy 15 more minutes. Boom. That call is done. They're having a conversation. You're off. Money deposit in your account. So... Typically, companies that I now build is based on a problem that annoyed me that I wish that product, like even this book, Choose Your Enemies Wisely. Yeah. For years, I recommend people books. Hey, can I get a book on improving my relation with my girlfriend? Five love languages. Yeah, hey, great. can I get a book on my marriage, husband and wife? We have two kids, but my wife's not respecting me. Both of you guys read the book, Love and Respect. Hey, man, I'm thinking about getting engaged to this girl. 101 questions to us. Hey, man, I just got out of the military. I'm rough around the edges. In sales, I'm kind of pissing a lot of people off. How to win friends and influence people. Hey, I want to read a book on goal setting. Go read Brian Tracy. Hey, I want to become a better leader. Go read you know, leadership on John Maxwell or Lincoln on leadership. Hey, I want to be better on private equity. Go read Stephen Schwartzman. Hey, I want to be a better executive. Go read Ride of a Lifetime by Bob Iger. Hey, I want to improve compensation plan. Go read Vernon Harish's book. Anyways, everything I want to have a book that I can give to you 
that you can go and prove. You know what's the problem? Do you know what book right now you recommend if you want somebody to go write a business plan going into a new year? It does not exist. So I'm talking to Penguin CEO. I said, guys, we're going to write a business planning book that can be applied to a military general, to a CEO, to a founder, to an athlete, to a politician, to a billionaire, to a millionaire, to somebody getting started. And this is why we write the book, Choose Your Enemies Wisely, Business Planning for the Audacious Few, exact format on how to write a plan. So when you ask me about the Mr. Olympia thing, what am I going to do with Mr. Olympia? I don't have any interest in that. Today, we, we want to, to do what we want to do with the next vision of what we're building. If you come to Florida, I'll show the whole campus that we're building. To do what we want to do, we need real resources. Dude, I made a $100 million offer to Tucker Carlson. Public for offer. What? For him to come to Valuetainment. When I saw Fox that. Fired I saw him. that. I make a $100 million offer. And you know what he does? Nothing. He what doesn't do you, even. Did he do the Twitter thing? He went, he went to Twitter. Yeah. But you know what he's trying to say? You know what publicly he said? He said, Pat, Elon's retweet of my videos every week is worth more than your $100 million. By the way, he just started a media company. You know how much he raised his first round? How much money do you think he raised? 15 million bucks. That's it. Mm. He just raised 15 million five weeks ago. 15? One five. Tucker Carlson started a media company, raised 15 million bucks. I, I offered the guy a hundred million dollars and this guy goes and raises 15 million dollars for a media company right 100 million liquid i gave him a hundred million dollar offer was it for four years or five years it was five, five okay, years five with years. equity in the company okay. and president and creativity and decision making and then this guy goes and tucker carlson raises 15 million dollars to start a new media company right but to him elon's retweet was worth way more money than my $100 million. Well, you know what that made me think? I said, damn, I'm broke. <laughs> I, swear to, yeah. I swear to God. Oh, yeah, God. I, I'm it, telling dude. you. Dude. I said, damn, I'm I broke. I didn't think you were going to say that. That was funny. I, I sat there. Son I'm like, I got to freaking go make some money. Yeah. Because what do you think I, he would have took it for? I don't think he would have taken it. I don't think it was a money thing with Tucker. Yeah, clearly. I think Tucker wanted to reach because I'm convinced... I don't know if this is going to happen or not. I think there's an alliance built between him, Musk, and Trump. And I don't know what that is. These guys are, there's something going on with alliances. I think the three are very different, and they're all very powerful. And I, feel all, like, I feel like Kanye is somewhere they're floating around too, no? Kanye is problematic for, yeah. for them. So they're kind of like maybe behind closed doors because Elon always defends Kanye, but uh, maybe not face you know, some people like behind closed doors, yeah. you talk to them all the time, but nobody knows about it. Yeah. But I think uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Tucker in his mind is like, you know what? Screw you guys. I'm going to go be the Churchill of U.S. Because Churchill was a journalist. And then later on, he ends up becoming the prime minister of a, yeah. and he saves the free world and going up against Hitler. And he had the brass to go up against them or else you and I would be talking German. So I, I don't think <laughs> it was any money what I could have offered for Tucker to come through to us. I don't think I have enough of a platform yet that's big enough with enough proposition for a talent that big to say i want to team up with you and we're, yeah. we're working on that that's what yeah. we're working on right now yeah because that he chose twitter obviously smart move yeah respect what besides i guess this olympia buying what what are you like and the uh, manect yeah obviously the book what else do you have like plan big plans or what are you what else are you working on oh, currently great question so to us right now the main driver so in everything you do you have to be thinking about what is your advantage uh, uh, and why you're doing what you're doing. So I need a lot of money to fulfill the vision that I have. The money uh, I need, I don't have right now. I have a few hundred million dollars in cash, but I don't have a lot of money where I can go play ball. I have enough money to not be a beggar today, which is great. And I don't take a penny off my business. I didn't do it with the insurance company I did that I grew from 66 agents to 45,000 that I sold a year and a half ago. And so now... The next phase is our consult, consulting firm, Bedeva Consulting, is growing exponentially, okay? And what Bedeva Consulting is, we consult for different stages of a business. So if you're, whether you're starting your new business and you want to know how to get your first customer or whether you're trying to figure out how to put a partnership together with a guy 50-50 because, you know, sometimes you start a podcast with somebody, you start a business with somebody, you start a company with somebody, and if the terms are not written up front, you're, it's a recipe for disaster. You're from now, five years from now, so... Oh, it's I better doing all of that one, up front. I experienced that one it, incredibly uh, drastically. Yeah, I had a business, uh, 
an apparel company that I started in 2015 that I had another um, another company that was running my back end. And for the next eight years, they were leveraging all the data and information while they were building like a very similar, like close to exact sort of product alongside of it and selling it like alongside of it. Like to the point where if I made some joggers, it was like switch a logo and put a different logo. And then also like taking my customer list when we were splitting and, and then me also building another company that was third party products in the same industry. So even more of a data grab, like so to, to other big influencers, like making, so imagine I met some people who were reselling Converse and, uh, and uh, reselling random stuff on Amazon. And then I was like, I'm just, this, this is back in 2015. That's when like the internet was really doing this. With like uh, mm -hmm. selling products mm -hmm. and influencers were selling brands. Jim Shark, like this is post Jim, Jim Shark or during? this was the right after Jim Shark. Got it, right? And then so I'm I'm making like I'm selling hats and tank tops, and then they had their brand, and it was like every moment it was like if I'm ordering a thousand units, I go order three hundred, but get my pricing, and then I add all these other all these other tools to the pot as far as uh, influencers selling, and so then they're buying products, so now that they can go to manufacturers and get these pricings. I literally did this for years, and I I. I didn't think that I would get turned on the way that I did, but then it made sense because it was just, it became just competition to the same people where it was like, oh, the minute that they could turn, like really turn that on. That happens me. so many times. And so bro, annoying. And it's so funny because I, I remember I, I talked about, about, I don't know, maybe six months ago, I finally told a story. And, I, and one, of my, one of my worst mistakes, and the reason why I'm telling you the story right now is because I want to say this to anyone listening. Um, my worst mistake was not standing up and telling the truth and not telling my side of a story because I was getting slandered for all kinds of just bullshit. You know, they could drag or allowed to be dragged because it benefited them financially as far as like swaying customer opinion. Mm -hmm. And my worst mistake that I ever made in my whole career of like social media was not speaking up sooner and not telling the truth sooner and not standing on that value sooner. And that was my biggest mistake, man. One of my biggest mistakes. It 15? hurt me. You said 2015? 2015 till... Did you get money when you guys sold or walked away or no? No, no, it was, it was a mess, dude. It was a mess. So you see, that's, it was that's, a complete it, mess. And it was, it was insane. I didn't, because I was, I was younger and I'm thinking yeah. like, I'm doing all this content. Shit mm -hmm. I just, you guys, I trust you guys. And I built this good relationship. So I thought like they had my back in a way. So I'm naively thinking, no, they wouldn't f me over. And then even five years along when I was like, I'm starting to ask questions like, well, why am I paying this much for this? And you're paying that much for this when I know I'm bringing in this many more units. And, you know, then it eventually it shifted over time. But like, I'm, I'm just like, I'm catching all these little things and I'm kind of just letting it go because I'm being, I guess, too nice or not as, as like, maybe I'm not pressing it as hard as I should or not being like, hey, we need to write up a contract now for this. And I just let myself get fucked because I just thought, well, why would they do me like that? But now it's like, now it makes sense. It just. So by the way, if you ever get married, this is exactly why you should also have a prenup. I'm a yeah. big prenup guy. Everything up front you have, it eliminates future arguments. Everything. Yeah. Everything up front. So. So the Bedevic Consulting side, it like we'll sit with a guy like you and like, hey, I'm about to go into a deal with this. What do you think I should structure it as? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Which law firm are you using? How are you going to set this up? What commitment are they making? What's your commitment to them? What if this guy, so that's phase. What if the phase of you want to go be a tech enabled company? How are you going to do it? How much money are you going to put into it? How are you going to be different than what's out there? Or maybe you want to go hire your first C-suite because people are scared on their first C-suite they're higher. Or maybe you want to bring five C-suites at the same time because you're raising 10 million bucks and you don't know how to go raise 10 million bucks. So we're going to help you put a pitch deck together or you're about to sell your company. Is it ready to sell? Have you sat with investment bankers? What point are they asking from you? What is the EBITDA calculation today for 7X, 10X, 15X? What is it? Like I remember the first time I went to New York and I sat with, with these six or seven investment bankers and one of the investment bankers selling insurance companies, they specialize in selling companies sizes 25 to 50 million bucks. The two of them I sat down with, they sold 50 million to 250 million bucks. The other two guys I sat down with, they sold companies 250 million to a few billion dollars, right? So these guys are like, nah, we're not interested in your company, your small company. I'm like, no, no, I'm interested in you because I want you to sell my company, right? Because these guys sell the bigger guys. Yeah. These guys are like, oh, we're interested in you. I'm like, of course you'd be interested because you can sell my company for 100 million right now. You'd get a check. So I said, what do I need to do to get bigger valuation for my company? He says, well, the way you're set up right now, you're probably going to get 7x EBITDA. So if you're doing 10 million a year, they're going to pay you 70 million bucks for your company. I'm like, I'm not freaking selling for seven times my EBITDA. 
I said, what do I need to do to sell for 15 times? And this is just EBITDA. on the consulting part, right? No, this is my insurance company oh, insurance that company. I sold. Okay. So, but, but what I'm doing is I'm teaching the client, the business owner, how to get the highest valuation when they sell rather than the lowest valuation. I understand, yeah. So then the guy tells me, he says, well, they're paying 15x if you have software and technology. I said, dude, I got all the software. He says, do you own it? I said, yeah, I paid the licensing fee of 100000 Or He says, no, do you own the software? Yeah. I own the license. So we went and invested $3 million into software called Bamboo. Today, it's around $10 million. That took our company's valuation from seven times EBITDA to 15 times EBITDA. Because you had the software. Because we were a tech-enabled insurance company. So it doesn't matter what phase you're in. We sit down with clients. We have around 3,000 clients. And we consult for you whatever phase you're at. And we you know, deal with you directly or your board or your executive team. So that consulting firm is growing rapidly and that's bringing the money to reinvest into other businesses and it's allowing us to have a division of product development which we have Minect and other products and then eventually these resources are going to allow us to do movies shows docs a bunch of different things but right now we need to go i love it man. make a lot well, of money I, it's so great i know you have to leave it's like i could i have like a thousand i really enjoy talking to you I, I really enjoy talking to you you're you're a in in Farsi, they would call you Yarmi. You're like a, you're like a homie. You're like a, you know, guy you want to talk to and hang with. You give that vibe. Oh, I appreciate yeah. it, man. Yeah, it's been a blessing. So I know you got to go. I respect the time. I'd love to talk to you again, or just even off pod, off camera. I look forward to it. Yeah, very very sharp. Someone I feel like I could see, I could learn from. Um, so thank you so much for coming. I hope everyone comes. I hope you guys check out the book. When does that drop? Uh, December fifth. Amazon. Okay. Choose your enemies wisely. And then so the consulting thing is that something that like. Not anyone could really do, I'm assuming, right? It seems like they it's can, more of they a... They can go to bedavidconsulting.com and apply. And depending on what problem you're trying to solve, if we can do it, great. If not, we would let you know. But anybody can apply for it. Okay, Yeah. cool. Well, make sure you guys subscribe every Tuesday, 11 a.m. We're on Spotify, we're on iTunes, we're on everything. Bro, thank you so much for coming. Hey, it's been a pleasure. It, really yeah, you're it. awesome, man. My man.